Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. I'm Councilmember Danny Rodriguez, the chair of the Committee of Transportation. Today, the committee will be considering two bills. The first bill is intro 1457, sponsored by Councilmember Carlos Menchaca in relation to cyclists following pedestrians' control signals. The second bill is intro 1557, sponsored by Speaker Corey Johnson in relation to five-year plan for city streets, sidewalks, and pedestrian spaces. A bill that I believe will make our streets safer for everyone. At this time, I would like to turn over to the speaker uh, so that he will deliver his opening statement. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Rodriguez. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I love New York City. It is the best city to live and work in in the world. Uh, but we can do better. We can make New York a safer, more livable, and more equitable city. We can have a city where it's easier for everyone to get around, where a physical disability doesn't prevent you from taking advantage of all that this city has to offer, where businesses thrive because people want to spend time outdoors, exploring neighborhoods, where commuting by bus doesn't mean wasting hours away from your family every week stuck in traffic, where working as a delivery cyclist, hopping on a city bike, or crossing the street to get to your corner bodega doesn't mean risking your life. When we give space back to people, when we put people instead of cars first, great things can happen. We can improve the quality of life of all New Yorkers. That's why I devoted my first State of the City address as speaker to transportation. It's not just about congestion and traffic safety, it's about building the kind of city we wanna live in. And it's about all of us. I laid out a vision for all New Yorkers in that speech and I'm proud to be here today to start the process of realizing that vision. So today we will discuss a bill that I've sponsored that would require a master plan for New York City streets. For the first time, the city would be required to look at our streets in a comprehensive, holistic way. Not one neighborhood or street at a time the way we do it now. And this bill recognizes that we need to think seriously about how we share space on our streets. Cars cannot continue to rule the road. It is not safe and it is not sustainable. Pedestrian deaths are up over 20% this year. The number of people killed while riding a bike is up over 60%. We can do better and we must do better. So this bill will set aggressive citywide benchmarks, not goals, benchmarks on protected bike lanes, bus lanes, and pedestrian space. That means at least 30 miles of new bus lanes and transit signal priority in at least 1,000 intersections per year to get buses moving again. That means giving pedestrians, people riding bikes, and people with disabilities their fair share of our streets. That means dramatically expanding the city's plaza and shared streets programs, redesigning and making every signaled intersection accessible. And that means installing at least 50 miles of bike lanes with real physical protection, not just green paint, per year, and completing a fully connected bike network by 2030. I want every neighborhood in this city to feel like home to every New Yorker, no matter how you get around. We're not doomed to have a city dominated by constant honking, pollution, and near misses with cars. We control our streets, and we know how to fix them. Now we just need the will to get it done, and this won't be easy. This bill is ambitious, but I truly believe that if we stay true to what's important and to our vision for a safe, livable, and truly inclusive city, that we will get there. I wanna thank you again, Chair Rodriguez, for holding today's hearing. I wanna give a big thank you to all the advocates that have worked tirelessly on this issue for so many years. And I wanna thank uh, one of the best commissioners in the entire city of New York, someone who I'm really proud to have a great partnership with, who has been, a, I think, a transformative leader in her vision in the last five and a half years in changing the way we get around New York City. I really wanna thank Commissioner Trottenberg, who's gonna to testify today. I'm grateful for her entire team and the work that we've done together. They've always been responsive. They've always been helpful. And I look forward to continuing to build on that great partnership that we have. So with that, I want to turn it back to you, Chair Rodriguez, and thank you again for chairing this hearing today. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. And I also would like to add my compliment on how we've been so lucky to have a DOT commissioner 
that, as I said before, not only is a great New Yorker, but so and also that brought a lot of national expertise when it comes to transportation. So as we are discussing this view of this plan, it's not about her lack of leadership, but this is about what are we leaving in place for the, not only for the present, but also for the future administration. Uh, so that uh, we all appreciate the leadership and the great job that you have done in your whole team working in collaboration. And thank you, Speaker, for your leadership and vision on how to improve the transportation infrastructure in our great city. As you most know, early this year, Speaker Johnson delivered his first State of the City address that focused primarily on transit issues and offer a comprehensive transportation master plan for our city of New York. We live in a very busy city, one where trucks, cars, buses, cyclists, pedestrians all need to share our street. As a chair of the Committee on Transportation, my goal has been to make New York City the most walkable, pedestrian-friendly city in the nation. And that's what I, I have even asking for a plan to reduce the numbers of New Yorkers who own vehicle from 1.4 million that we have today to 1 million by 2030. We need to ensure that when our pedestrians and cyclists go onto the street, they remain protected and secure. We have to decrease the numbers of crashes we see in the city. It, we do need to get the city to have a master plan when it comes to transportation issues and the way we design our street. Again, that's a plan that we should work together, not only for the current administration, but for administrations to come in the future. Intro 1557, which I have also co-sponsored, will require DOT to implement a master plan that set certain goals and benchmarks for redesigning all aspects of the transportation network in New York City. This is a noble goal, and I look forward to working with the speaker, the administration, my colleagues, and advocates to ensure that the bills get all the support that is needed. As mentioned earlier, we will also be considering intro 1457. This bill will also allow cyclists to follow pedestrian control signals when crossing a roadway at an intersection as long as they yield to pedestrians. A recent pilot study conducted by DOT found that bicyclists would benefit from getting the same head start as pedestrians currently do to cross an intersection. This bill could provide our cyclists with increased safety while traveling throughout our city. Now we're gonna be calling the first panel uh, and then we, it will be followed by the administration. Susan Duha, Mark O'Connor, Blythe Austin, Chris Widello, Danny Perlstein, And let me also recognize my, our colleagues who are here, Councilmember Dodge, DES, Cool, Richards, and Richards. Councilmember Wills is here. Ross, I'm sorry. Uh, So you may begin, we're trying to see how we can maintain in three minutes, and if it's more, so please summarize. Thank you. Just make sure the red light is on. Thank, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Speaker Johnson, and thank you, council members, for this opportunity to testify in relation to the plans for city streets, sidewalks, and pedestrian routes. We gratefully applaud the effort uh, that has been made and the proposed local law discussed today. As you know, the Center for Independence of the Disabled is among the pioneers of accessibility and transportation for people with disabilities. We were involved in the campaign to make New York City buses accessible. We were involved in the Taxis for All campaign. 
Uh, we most recently succeeded in negotiating a binding settlement agreement that will result in making curb cuts compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act citywide that will require uh, maintenance of those curb cuts as well, transparency and an independent monitor. And we're very proud of that achievement. We're also involved in three lawsuits as a lead plaintiff um, in state and federal court to try to bring about an accessible subway system as has already been achieved in many cities in the United States and is currently underway in others. Um, we are an independent living center. Our leadership and our staff are people with disabilities, including myself, and we serve people with disabilities in New York City. Last year, we reached around 52,000 individuals with disabilities with benefits advisement, education, and advocacy. As you know, people with disabilities face heightened dangers when attempting to cross city streets. And uh, people whose disabilities affect their mobility, people who are blind or have low vision, people who are deaf or hard of hearing, need street and pedestrian pathways that reduce the risk of collision, injury, or death. I speak of this from personal experience I was crossing a street in New York City and was hit by a car uh, in, while I was in the intersection. Um, I was in the walkway, I had the light, but nonetheless was injured and acquired a traumatic brain injury at that time. We believe that this legislation, with its goal of improved access, will make an enormous difference in our daily lives. Uh, we applaud the idea of separating traffic to reduce collisions. We believe it will help. We believe that audible signals will be very beneficial. Uh, we look forward to seeing what shelter upgrades would look like and um, ensuring that they are fully accessible for people with disabilities and that people can board and disembark from buses easily at bus stops. We welcome pedestrian spaces and we hope that the street furniture and other features will be organized in such a way as to avoid creating impassable spaces for people who are wheelchair users. Um, we certainly uh, look forward to the transparency aspects of the proposal. We believe in accountability and in transparency and we think this will encourage the public to have confidence in what is coming forward. Um, we look forward to learning the details of all of these plans and to contributing to the extent that we can to ensure that the plans made going forward pursuant to these legislative initiatives uh, fulfills the promise that it's making to make streets safer for people with disabilities. I thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you. And can you please say your name for the record? My name is Susan Dua, Executive Director, Center for Independence of the Disabled New York. Good afternoon. My name is Mark O'Connor. I am Interim Co-Executive Director with Transportation Alternatives. And um, I want to applaud uh, you, Council Speaker Johnson, Chairman Rodriguez, for putting forth uh, these bold plans. Um, and thank you, Council Members, for, for having this, this hearing. Um, I'm here to testify in strong support of both bills uh, in today's hearing. For 46 years, transportation alternatives have advocated on behalf of New Yorkers for safer, more inclusive, and more livable streets. With more than 150,000 people in our network, nearly 10,000 dues-paying members, and over 1,000 activists throughout all five boroughs, we fight to promote biking, walking, and public transportation as alternatives to the car for all New Yorkers. We support the master plan. At Transportation Alternatives, we are guided in our support of policy, not by politics, but by data. And the data is overwhelmingly clear. The measures and ben benchmarks proposed in this legislation is proven to save lives, improve bus transit service, promote the healthiest and most environmentally friendly transportation modes, including biking, and to make our streets more accessible. These are improvements that all New Yorkers deserve. In New York City, most households don't own a car. 
the vast majority of New Yorkers commute by public transit or walk, and countless New Yorkers want to bike or spend time in, uh, in car-free places. But sadly, and to the detriment of us all, 80% of our street space is dedicated to the movement or storage of harmful cars and trucks, with cars sitting still, parked, 95% of the time on average. That is inequitable and harmful use of our streets. This master plan takes a giant leap forward by addressing these inequities. Importantly, this visionary master plan would require many improvements at a pace that our current crises in these areas require. More than 6,000 people have been killed in traffic on New York City streets since 2001. We don't feel safe walking and have far too few oases of calm space. Numerous areas of our city are congested with cars, buses move at walking speeds, and we need to reduce carbon emissions and reach our 80 by 50 goals and mission zero in our lifetimes. Far too often, people in New York City have lost their lives due to inadequate street dis designs, and far too often, improved designs only come after tragedy has struck. The current pace of improvements is, plain and simply, inadequate to meet these crises. For these reasons, we strongly support the master plan, and we have four brief recommendations. One, to require benchmarks for bicycle parking facilities, including bike racks and corrals. Two, require benchmarks for daylighting of intersection to increase safety and micro-mobility parking. Three, require benchmarks for expansion of sidewalk space to promote walking. Four, require benchmarks for protected intersections to improve safety and bicycling. These are measures that we believe would, it will improve this already um, promising and great uh, legislation. Lastly, I want to register our support for intro 1457 for bicyclist use of pedestrian control signals. Thank you very much. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, Chair Rodriguez, and members of the City Council, thank you for inviting members of Families for Safe Streets to share our stories of traffic violence here today. My name is Blythe Austin. In November of 2017, I was in a crash with a minivan driver while I was riding my bike down Nevin Street in Burham Hill in Brooklyn. I broke my ankle and chipped my two front teeth. Shortly after my crash, the Department of Transportation approved a safe street redesign of Fourth Avenue in Brooklyn, which runs parallel to Nevin Street. These bike lanes were supposed to be fully installed by now, but the Department of Transportation has delayed installation and has only just started installing the lanes with no timetable for the project's completion. If Fourth Avenue had had protected bike lanes in November of 2017, I would have been riding my bike there, and I would not have been in a crash, and I would not have been hurt. My experience shows the urgency of safe street redesign. All too often, our elected officials and our government bureaucrats agree that streets should be redesigned, and even say that streets will be redesigned, but then they delay these installations for years. These delays have a human cost. More crashes and more people hurt, just like I was hurt. Because our streets are designed for cars to go fast and not for people to walk or to bike safely. The bill before you calls for the installation of at least 50 miles of protected bike lanes each year. It is ambitious, but it is just this kind of ambition and urgency that we need to make our streets safe. Our current system for street redesign does not work. My only concern is that this bill does not go far enough to make streets safer, particularly at intersections. About half of fatal crashes and more than half of crashes involving pedestrians occur at intersections in New York City. This bill needs to mandate policies that will make intersections safer for pedestrians to cross. First, the bill should mandate either lead pedestrian intervals or exclusive pedestrian crossings at all intersections. That is, pedestrians should either get a few seconds head start to cross an intersection before cars can go, or pedestrians should be able to cross in all directions at an intersection while all vehicles at the intersection have a red light. These designs are easy and cheap to achieve. Just change the timer on lights and we know that they prevent crashes and save lives where they are now. So why not spread them across the entire city? Second, 
We need to improve driver sight lines at intersections so that drivers can see pedestrians, particularly children, the elderly, and people in wheelchairs, and not hit them. This type of redesign is called daylighting. It is also easy and cheap to achieve. Just remove all vision barriers, including parking spaces, within 10 feet of a crosswalk or intersection. Imagine how many fewer crashes we would have and how many lives would be saved if this bill mandated clear sight lines. Some drivers won't like this proposal because it means removing a few parking places. But those parking places have a human cost. I know how highly you value human lives because you put forward this bill and we're having this hearing here today. I hope that you will make this wonderful and life-saving bill even stronger by adding provisions to prevent intersection crashes. Thank you. Speaker Johnson, Chairman Rodriguez, and members of the council, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. My name is Chris Wydello. I'm the Associate State Director for AARP here in New York City. Um, and uh, wanted to share with you some demographics and some information about uh, how our population is aging and the, and the need to have, uh, live, and in order to have livable communities, the need to have complete streets, as we call it at AARP. Um, you know, complete streets is our term for sh streets that can accommodate modes of all modes of transportation, pe pedestrians, people on bikes, uh, cars, of course, trucks, uh, and, and making sure that our neighborhoods, you know, when they are going under uh, being redesigned or uh, rezoned, that they incorporate all these features into those neighborhoods because it's, it's essential. Even if we have affordable housing, if we don't have the infrastructure or the, uh, the roadways and um, easements for all users, it's sort of, uh, you know, misses the mark. Um, you know, livable communities are very important to ARP because our population is aging very rapidly. We just released a report a few months ago with the Center for Urban Future, and it provided a lot of new data about aging, the aging population in New York City. The study revealed that the number of older adults in New York City uh, residents aged 65 and older increased 12 times faster than the city's under 65 population over the past decade. And there are now a record 1.24 million uh, adults aged 65 and older they're living in the five boroughs. And according to the, re the report as well, uh, New York City added uh, 237,000 older adults between 2007 and 2017, which is a 24% increase. And during the same period, the city's under 65 population increased by only 2%. Um, every day, 10,000 people across the country turn 65 and older. Uh, and this is, has happened for the last 10 years and will continue to happen for the next few years. And so as our population ages, we need to make sure that people can get around and do the things that they want to do in their communities. And uh, having complete streets and, and the plan that you have introduced is uh, vitally important to that, uh, to people living in their homes and in their communities and being able to age in place, which is what people want to do. They would much rather stay where they've lived their whole lives. Uh, last year, we also uh, released a report called uh, Disrupting Racial and Ethnic Disparities, Solutions for New Yorkers Age 50 Plus. We partnered with the Hispanic Federation, the Asian American Federation, NAACP, and Urban League to look at racial and ethnic disparities within the 50 plus um, uh, age group. And two of the findings in the area of livable communities uh, had to do with not only accessible um, you know, public transportation and the ability to get to our public transportation, but also uh, one of the findings was that in African American, black, uh, Asian, and Hispanic neighborhoods have a greater number of pedestrian accidents due to unsafe crossings um, than their white counterparts. And so the things that we can do to minimize those fatalities and make those uh, our roadways safer for all users um, also has an impact on uh, in communities of color and um, you know making this uh, city as fair f for everyone so thank you very much for the opportunity to speak thank you can someone switch out with Danny Perlstein yes, thank you yep Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Speaker Johnson, Chair Rodriguez, and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Danny Perlstein. I am the Riders Alliance Policy and Communications Director. The Riders Alliance is New York's grassroots organization of subway and bus riders. Uh, there are more than two million daily bus riders on New York City Transit and MTA local buses in New York City, which is remarkable considering that our bus service is the slowest of any big city in the United States. In addition to being slow, bus service is unreliable 
And as a result, for the past decade and a half, ridership has been tragically falling because the bus is the most efficient and affordable way to get around city streets. Intro 1557 would change the game for two million plus daily bus riders. Um, 30 bus lane miles a year is the most ambitious target that anyone's proposed to date. Um, planning for bus lanes on literally hundreds of routes citywide would revolutionize our bus service. And uh, for a lot of the reasons Chris was just explaining, a progressive city must do better for bus riders and must deliver for our bus riders. Um, it's a matter of basic fairness. Folks who ride the bus earn an average of $28,000 annually. That's significantly below the average New Yorker, and it's even further below the average subway rider. 75% of bus riders are people of color. The elderly and folks from immigrant communities disproportionately ride the bus and depend on the bus. Um, New York City Transit President Andy Byford, Commissioner Trottenberg and the DOT, Mayor de Blasio, have taken serious and crucial steps over the past year to improve our bus service. And today's legislation from Speaker Johnson ups the ante. It's a powerful vision for bus riders across the city to look forward to while we're, we're still, unfortunately, stuck on the bus. Thank you. I want to thank you all uh, for coming to testify today, and not just for, of course, your presence here uh, today, but also the advocacy that you do year-round, the smart, thoughtful, innovative policies, the organizing efforts, the advocacy, the policy papers, everything that you all do really informs and educates us as a city council. And I know similarly the Department of Transportation and when, when we're considering pieces of legislation and when we are doing things to try to make our city a safe, more livable city. So I really wanna thank you for being here today for your, again, specific thoughtful testimony that we are going to definitely um, use in continuing to craft this legislation. Uh, so I really, really wanna thank you all for being here today. And, and I don't know if uh, Chair Rodriguez has anything else before we we call up uh, the Department of Transportation. Anything? Obviously, adding my voice and thanking you guys for being a team player, what we're doing. And and I know that even a DOT recognizing, you know, all of us about how the, the you guys from Transportation Alternative, Family for Safety Streets, Riders Alliance and others, and, and the institution and the voice advocating for individual you know, the one million New Yorkers with disability. You know, I think that having a Royal a DOT is someone that a play a role, a, that is someone from the, our community who live everyday life, all the challenges that they, if New Yorkers with disability have, show the commitment on DOT to say we are open. But I think this is about the urgency, and I appreciate that you are the voices for making our streets safe for everyone are a, hope being a partner with this proposal that the speaker already has presented to having a master plan. So thank you for your work. Thank you all. Uh, the, come on up, Polly, thank you, and your team. We would like to ask our council, our committee council, to please administer the oath. So I think the committee council will uh, swear the commissioner and her team, anyone else who may be answering questions uh, in before the testimony begins. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee? and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, Speaker Johnson, Chairman Rodriguez, and members of the Transportation Committee. I'm Polly Trottenberg, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation. With me today are Deputy Commissioner for Transportation Planning and Management, Eric Beaton, and Assistant Commissioner for Street Improvement Project, Sean Quinn. 
We're very happy to be here today on behalf of Mayor de Blasio to testify on intros 457, 1457 and 1557. The administration shares the goals that intro 1557 puts forth, and we welcome the conversation on the policy, political, budgetary, and operational issues it raises, with a growing city and finite street space, the need to tackle climate change, and the urgency to provide safe, equitable, green, and accessible mobility, we must continue to transform and humanize our streets and prioritize more efficient, environmentally friendly modes. DOT is rising to the challenge, guided by citywide planning documents like 1NYC and the 80 by 50 Greenhouse Gas Reduction Plan, as well as DOT-specific publications like our Strategic Plan, our Vision Zero Pedestrian Safety Action Plans, our Safer Cycling Plan, and the Mayor's Better Buses Action Plan. You can see them all on the board behind me. We think our documents present an ambitious vision that we're focused every day on delivering, but we're happy to discuss the value of bringing all that work into a single planning document. And while we are very proud of the world-class studies and strategy documents, we think what has distinguished DOT under this administration is our execution. We've dramatically increased our output of projects to make our streets safer, greener, smarter, and more equitable and accessible, all while having substantive community input. This includes increasing the miles of bike lanes by a third in the last five years from 908 to 1,240, including 83 miles of protected lanes, increasing the number of bus lanes, miles of bus lanes by nearly 50% from 75 to 112, and implementing over 514 separate street improvement projects under Vision Zero, compared to 242 prior to Vision Zero. We know of no other US city that is accomplishing this dramatic pace of transformation, tackling big, challenging projects. At DOT, we are proud and passionate about our work and always strive to accomplish more but achieving the targets in the bill as drafted would require a significantly reconfigured agency. The bill's vast new operational requirements would necessitate significant additional funding from the city budget, which we estimate to be several billion dollars, new headcount, new facilities, and equipment. Furthermore, the magnitude of the changes proposed would require a new re-envisioned public engagement model, perhaps with fewer mandated requirements for work with the city's 59 community boards, and the work we do with council members, borough presidents, state and federal elected officials, bids, major institutions, civic groups, and all the numerous other entities that are affected by DOT's work. The bill would also require tremendous managerial and operational bandwidth at DOT. This is at a time when the agency is already managing enormous growth and undertaking major new initiatives as well as our core mission. In the last five years, the mayor and council have increased DOT's operating budget by a total of 25% from approximately 850 million to over a billion. We've increased our headcount by nearly 20%, from approximately 4,600 employees to 5,500, and we have 100 more hires planned. The mayor and council, and we're very grateful for this, have doubled our 10-year capital plan from approximately 8 billion to over 16 billion. And in FY18, we committed a record 2.2 billion worth of projects and achieved a capital commitment rate of 81%, which is up from 42% at the start of this administration. And as I noted above, we're taking on several enormous new projects to which we will be devoting significant resources and attention. The scale and scope of these undertakings is dramatic. For example, as you heard earlier from the, from the testimony from the advocates, the city is committed to making our estimated 320,000 pedestrian ramps accessible, and we are moving ahead with a comprehensive plan. While other US cities are also grappling with this tremendous challenge, none are on the same scale we face. To accomplish our plan, DOT is engaged in a survey using high-definition street imagery and LIDAR to collect multiple measurements on each pedestrian ramp. We're constructing new and upgraded ramps with significantly expanded in-house crews as well as DDC-managed private contracts. For this work, the FY20 executive budget proposes $1.5 billion over the next 10 years in capital and expense funds and over 500 new staff for the agency for what will ultimately be a multi-billion dollar, multi-decade effort. We've dramatically, with the dramatically expanded speed camera authorization from the state, we are preparing to ramp up our program to be the largest in North America and among the largest in the world. This expansion from 140 to 750 school zones, which will do so much to help us achieve Vision Zero, will be an, un an enormous undertaking. It will require budgetary resources, many new employees to review violations as required by state law, and many millions of dollars in camera purchases the first installments of which are reflected in our proposed executive budget. All the while, we are also moving forward with Lyft to triple the number of city bikes to 40,000, double the size of the service area, and add more valet stations and docks in the busiest parts of the system. At the same time, we're looking to expand dockless bike share to all of Staten Island, 
And depending on what happens in Albany, we may be charged with figuring out how shared e-scooters and e-bikes will function on our streets. And of course, a major focus for DOT and this administration is working with the MTA as they implement congestion pricing for the Manhattan Central Business District, collaborating on traffic studies and evaluation, a parking study, and working with the MTA to improve transit options on day one of the plan. And at DOT, we're also planning to repurpose street capacity for buses, bikes, and pedestrians, as London has done. Other cities all around the country are watching New York, and we intend to rise to this historic challenge. All this comes on top of everything DOT is already doing. Overall, our agency manages and maintains the city's 6,000 miles of streets, 12,000 miles of sidewalks, and nearly 800 bridges, the largest and most complex urban street network in North America, as well as the Staten Island Ferry, the second largest public ferry in the country. On Vision Zero in 2018, we saw our fifth annual decline in traffic fatalities yet again bucking the national trend, but fatalities are currently up 25% compared to last year, and recent tragedies underscore the urgency of our work. There's much more to do, and we have always known that progress will not be linear. Vision Zero is this administration's top transportation priority, one that requires extensive resources and managerial focus from all levels of the agency, as well as constant collaboration with our sister agencies and other stakeholders. But looking ahead, our dramatic speed camera expansion will play a big role. And along with targeted enforcement and education, we will continue our exponentially increased output of safety projects. We've increased leading pedestrian interval installations by 5,000% compared to pre-vision zero averages, increased corridor retimings by over 800%, tripled the pace of our street improvement projects, and more than tripled the pace of installing protected bike lanes. I'll just point to my written testimony to give more details on sort of what I would call DOT's bread and butter work. But that work on our roads, bridges, sidewalks, traffic operations, parking and ferries, it doesn't often make big headlines, but it is essential for the safety, mobility, and quality of life for millions of New Yorkers. And I want to take this opportunity to especially thank the dedicated men and women of DOT who work so hard and deliver for this city every day. Let me now turn towards some of the major areas of intro 1557. First on buses, in his State of the City address this year, the mayor committed to the ambitious goal of increasing bus speeds by 25% by 2020. Building on this announcement, DOT released its Better Buses Action Plan, which prevents a vision for how to improve bus service citywide and complements the MTA's fast forward plan. DOT is committed to installing 10 to 15 miles of new dedicated bus lanes each year, which is double the pace we have been installing them at, upgrading five miles of existing bus lanes annually, bringing TSP to 300 intersections each year and making at least 10 bus stops fully accessible every year, along with many other upgrades. We plan to work with New York City Transit as they complete their borough bus redesigns, implementing borough-wide bus priority programs at the same time. We've included the first of these as part of the New York City Transit's draft Bronx plan, and we will work with them on the other boroughs, with Queens up next. Each location will also get our full planning and design effort, including analyzing parking and traffic impacts and working collaboratively with local stakeholders. Effective bus lane designs evolve a lot of trade-offs, like reduced curb access, parking and travel lane removals, and turn restrictions that can improve bus speeds and street safety, but are also very unpopular with local businesses and re residents. We've created a Better Buses Advisory Group with advocates, business and labor, elected officials, and other key stakeholders to help guide our work and build political support. And we would welcome council member support to ensure our bus lane designs remain robust and effective. Finally, the legislation calls for bus lanes that are either physically separated or camera enforced. We're excited to pilot two miles of physically separated bus lanes for the first time this year, and of course we look forward to implementing the city's first transit and truck priority street on 14th Street to accommodate New York City Transit's new M14 SBS serve. But we have a lot to learn as we undertake these new treatments, and we will be evaluating their performance. When it comes to camera enforcement, we're currently authorized by the state to deploy cameras on 16 bus routes. I want to thank Senator Kruger and Assemblywoman Rosick for fighting to reauthorize and expand the city's bus lane camera program. That program is set to expire next year, and passing this legislation is a top priority in Albany, and we welcome the council's support. On cycling, DOT seeks to double the number of active cyclists and make New York the best biking city in the U.S. Over the last three years, DOT has been adding an average of 62 miles of bike lanes a year to our 1,240-mile network, the largest in the country. This includes adding an average of 20 miles of protected bike lanes to our current 440, 480, up from about six, pre, six per year pre-Vision Zero. And I think you can see that up on the chart. 
We're not simply adding miles, but developing continuous protected corridors that allow cyclists to ride from downtown Brooklyn to the Bronx and from Queens Boulevard to Midtown Manhattan. As a key part of this, we're enhancing the connections to our East River bridges, including J Street, Grand Street, Delancey Street, Christie Street, and Park Row. We're adding bike infrastructure to the streets approaching the Harlem River bridges, as outlined in our Connecting Communities report, including Willis Avenue this year. We're also building out protected Manhattan crosstown routes. We've completed pairs of routes on 12th and 13th Streets and 26th and 29th Streets, and we expect to install another pair on 52nd and 55th Streets this year. Overall on bikes, we're focused on three key priorities, continuing to build out an interconnected protected network, enhancing safety in priority bicycle districts, neighborhoods that have high ridership but lack adequate bicycle infrastructure, including a commitment to create or enhance 75 lane miles in these districts by 2022. And you can see on the map, the districts are represented in those pink areas. We also have an ambitious citywide bike program for 2019, and you can see some of those details in my written testimony. Ultimately, our goal is a protected bike lane network that provides safe, appealing bicycle connections between major neighborhood centers complemented by local neighborhood connections. But bike lane implementation draws on many parts of the agency. Our bike staff take the lead, but work with our borough offices, traffic engineers, planners, as well as our marking signals and sidewalks division. We continually update our designs to make sure our work reflects best practices, which includes upgrading existing bike lanes and, in and intersections and we work to maintain curb access for residences, businesses, as well as traffic flow. Protected bike lanes in particular involve a lot of local outreach. Continuing to expand and truly weave an interconnected protected bike lane network into the fabric of our city streets involves more than just DOT. When bike lanes and bus stops are on the same side of the street, for example, we have to coordinate with New York City Transit on potential conflicts and design challenges. And I would give, for example, on 4th Avenue, New York City Transit is doing work on the R train underneath the street. So we've had to do some coordination there as well. That can sometimes impact our, our project timelines. Our projects include a substantial and labor-intensive review process by FDNY. And they may have to consider the use of smaller vehicles to navigate different street layouts. Department of Sanitation needs greater capacity to handle smaller spaces and narrower lanes with smaller vehicles for street sweeping and plowing. DDC needs greater capital management capacity to handle complex street designs. We need to have coordination with EDC on their complex capital projects. And as we build out more of these projects, we need further NYPD enforcement resources. Finally, all of these street designs come with greater ongoing maintenance requirements, from markings to delineators to medians and Jersey barriers, which we must plan for and fund as well. It's been exciting to implement these transformational projects all over the city, but they must also be kept in a state of good repair for all the years to come. DOT's pedestrian plaza program, now 10 years old, creates public space from underutilized portions of our right-of-way to enhance safety, walkability, and accessibility to transit while supporting neighborhood economic and civic life. This past year alone, we finished capital construction on seven plazas while adding another four new plazas, bringing our total to 79 citywide. A lot more goes into creating our plazas than simply designating areas for pedestrian use and adding amenities. Plazas in New York City require a local maintenance partner who can ensure the space remains clean, safe, inviting, and well-programmed. That requires local participation, resources, and organizational capacity, and is often performed by the neighborhood bid or civic association. These important partners are key to creating a successful plaza. The same is also true for shared streets. When done right, our plazas have transformed spaces previously dominated by cars like Times Square and become vital neighborhood focal points like Diversity Plaza and Jackson Heights. And our plaza partners perform extraordinary work for our neighborhoods. But when a plaza partner is absent, the space can quickly become derelict and detract from the neighborhood rather than enhance it. In 2016, the de Blasio administration created the One NYC Plaza Equity Program, which provides 1.4 million annually to lower capacity plaza partners, typically outside the Manhattan core. The funds are used for maintenance programming and landscaping assistance to cover 25 plazas, while also helping to strengthen the performance of the local partners. The program is essential, especially in lower income neighborhoods, and would need to grow as the program grows. Each plaza remains an ongoing resource and management commitment for both the city and the local partner. Lastly, the bill sets several benchmarks that touch on accessibility. I want to emphasize that all DOT design work complies with the ADA and we're passionately committed to full accessibility as part of everything we do. At the same time, as I described earlier, with an enormous commitment of resources and staff, the city has embarked on the tremendous challenge of upgrading all of our over 320,000 pedestrian ramps. 
When it comes to accessible pedestrian signals, we have the most ambitious retrofit program in the country, are including them in all new signal installations moving forward. For our retrofits, we work with the disability community and elected officials and utilize national design standards to identify and prioritize intersections which present crossing difficulty for low vision and blind pedestrians. It should be noted that there is also ongoing litigation on this issue. In conclusion, the team at DOT is excited about all the work before us, proud of our accomplishments to date, and grateful to the mayor and the council, and to you, Mr. Speaker, for a significant increase in resources and support over the last five years. And we're grateful, of course, to the advocacy community for their ongoing support of our work to transform city streets. But that growth has meant we're straining to find the hiring capacity, management bandwidth, and facilities to handle our enlarged scale of operations. We're also starting to exhaust local outside contracting capacity in certain areas, such as street striping and milling. And executing the work required on the scale and timeline and vision in this bill would necessarily mean a very different relationship with the council and community boards, which are also straining to keep up even with DOT's current roster of projects and a potentially pared down level of community engagement. In 2018, DOT conducted over 600 separate project presentations to community boards, as well as numerous other site visits, walkthroughs, and meetings. And our street ambassador outreach team visited 130 different locations, conducted over 3,700 surveys, and had close to 8,000 conversations with New Yorkers to support over 50 separate projects. And I, our borough commissioners, and other senior leaders also personally participate in dozens of town halls, open houses, council hearings, and site visits each year. And when we speak with many of you and your state and federal colleagues, we often hear a desire for more and not less of this type of engagement. DOT now faces ever greater council mandated reporting, notice, presentation, and waiting period requirements, and the body may want to take a hard look at reducing and streamlining these rather than adding. And I think we would need to explore further how the benchmarks in this bill square with the current level of engagement that communities, stakeholders, and elected officials expect. And all that being said, our engagement frequently leads to insights and improvements to our projects. And for every engagement process that moves too slowly, dozens of other projects are moving forward with implementation. As we like to say, we are not leaving any paint in the can at the end of each construction season. The de Blasio administration is grateful to the council for your support. We have accomplished so much, but we know there is much more to do to transform our city streets. We need the council's continued strong support and partnership to accomplish our shared goals, particularly for the most politically challenging projects in your districts, where you are respected local leaders. I'll just say now my written testimony also contains some comments on intro 1457, which the administration supports. And I will say then that we are grateful for the opportunity to testify today and look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Polly. Thanks, Commissioner, for, uh, for being here and for uh, all of your hard work. Um, I want to thank you for everything that you've done. You and your staff, have I said, as I said in my opening statement, have always been responsive, have always been thoughtful, have always been uh, deeply engaged, not just on the big picture issues that we talk about, but even on the most hyper-local issues in my council district. You all have always been uh, very responsive, so I'm grateful uh, for that. I think we've had a very, very good partnership. Uh, and as you can tell from this bill, and as you outlined in your testimony, uh, I'm hoping to see an even more ambitious vision for our city streets. And uh, I sort of feel like I'm not seeing enough movement towards a more modern, livable city, even with all of the incredible things that you outlined and that DOT has done. I feel like, and this is not your fault, I feel like we are stuck in the Robert Moses era uh, and that we still need to uh, push harder and harder to compete with cities around the world that are focused on meeting the needs of all residents, not just repeating some old patterns that existed before you became commissioner and before I was elected to the city council or us taking small incremental steps. So I want to ask you uh, just sort of generally, do you think that we are doing our best right now? And if not, what's holding us back? Is it money? Is it support from other agencies or city hall? Is it political will? What can we do better if we are not doing uh, enough right now? Right. I mean, I would always say, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for your comments, of course we can always do better. And you know, I've, I've often said in this job, it, it gives you great humility. You try your best, but there are always areas where you think you could do more. You know, I do, again, I sort of, I brought some visuals here to show that I think the work of the DOT team has been pretty extraordinary, always room for improvement, but I mean, we have, 
you know, dramatically picked up the pace of bike lane installation of buses. And I think I hear you, your vision for a larger planning document, but I did just want to make sure folks could see we have done a lot of extraordinary planning work. I think it's true. I appreciate your comment that, you know, I think as I tried to convey in my testimony, some of the areas where we need to do better, there's a lot of kind of interdependencies. And again, when the mayor announced, for example, his better buses plan, we decided, and we're happy to have some council members participating, including the chairman, to create a task force. Because we realized we sort of, we needed some help. We were really running into political challenges. We didn't feel like we were getting enough of a sense of all the stakeholders, and some of them are here today. Not only the traditional transit advocacy groups, but business groups, labor, disability groups, AARP, there's a whole, the community services society, a bunch of different players who we think can really help us convey that message that I think we often struggle with, admittedly, on things like bus lanes, that these are so important for millions of New Yorkers. So, you know, we want to step up and do better, but I think I want to convey in the testimony, it is, a, it is a real team effort. I mean, DOT is a piece of the transportation puzzle, but there are a lot of other organizations and players in the city that we need to work with on this. Is any of the challenge money? I know you talked about uh, money, uh, how much of an increase you've seen, but if you want to do something ambitious like this, there would be a significant cost involved. I mean, I, I certainly think the, the benchmarks laid out in the bill, there would be some significant costs. And again, I, I think as I tried to convey in my testimony, I, I do not want to complain about resources. This council and this mayor have given this agency a lot of resources. I mean, we have seen our budget rise dramatically, our headcount rise dramatically. More resources enable us to do more, but I think, as you're hearing in my testimony, money is not the only piece of the puzzle. And money isn't always just sort of, can always be applied in a linear fashion. You know, one thing I mentioned, for example, in terms of striping, we're doing so many projects now, bike lanes, bus lanes, Vision Zero projects, so many things that involve striping, as well as just our regular maintenance of the streets. We've basically used up the contracting capacity of the region. Striping is a kind of specialized business. There are a lot of barriers to entry. If we want to get into doing dramatically more projects, we would need to create more in-house striping capacity. That means hiring. That means finding the space for those employees. So, you know, costs can go like this, and then at some point you have to start making some, some jumps. Do you think we could be more aggressive? Even all the progress that you've I mean, in the I, visuals, I, 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 what yeah, can we do I, to be more? I more absolutely more? think we can be more aggressive, but but I would also say, and it, it's great to have this discussion with you all, and it's the thing I touched at in the end of my testimony. And I, you know, have a lot of the advocacy community here, and it's funny. On the one hand, they often express frustration that we take too long with our outreach, that we're engaging too much with community boards, that we should plow ahead. But then I often hear from a lot of the other stakeholders they want more engagement, more meetings, more time spent. I think. You know, when you're speaking about some other cities, other cities sometimes do that differently. And I think that's a question that's not just one for DOT to answer. I think that's one for the council and, frankly, your state counterparts who are also very engaged in our work. You know, if there is a way to streamline some of that, we're certainly interested in doing it. I don't want to lose working with local stakeholders and local institutions, though. In a lot of cases, they do make our projects better. What does that hospital on the block need? What does that grocery store need? What you know, wh what are the concerns of local neighbors? Those aren't things I want to shortchange, but it is true. Our process now can be very long and involved and involve a lot of meetings, a lot of stakeholder engagement, a lot of hearings, town halls, you name it. If there's a way to think through how to make that go more quickly but not shortchange the parts that are beneficial, happy to engage on that. Thank you. I, I want to talk a little bit about car culture right now. Car ownership uh, is up, as you know, for her vehicle ridership has skyrocketed, as, as you outlined in your testimony. Pedestrian deaths are up over 20% this year uh, from last year, and the number of people killed riding a bicycle in New York City is up 66% this year over where we were last year. But I don't see this just a safety issue, but it is, or an environmental issue, though it is. It's also, I believe, an economic justice issue, as you heard from the previous panel. Drivers tend to have much higher incomes than bus riders, and they're almost certainly doing better economically than delivery cyclists. Do you think that there are too many cars in New York City? I mean, I, I do absolutely think there are too many cars in New York City, but and I, I want to talk a little about, particularly about sort of the the topography and justice issue, because one of the things we've been proud of, and a point back here, and many, many in this room are familiar with our 
borough pedestrian safety action plans because that was an effort to look borough by borough where the crash data sent us. And you know, we, we just looked at where we saw the highest rates of fatalities and serious injuries and we have focused a lot of our design work, our enforcement, our education, we're gonna be focusing a lot of our speed camera installations on those quarters and they are all over the city. And so we, we really try in our work to look at data. Um, you know, we have worked, I think, to come up with some ways to tackle the issue of car culture beyond that and I, I certainly think congestion pricing is going to be something that is gonna have a profound effect on the city. I said in my testimony, we're very excited about it. We've looked to sister cities like London to see what they have done. They have reclaimed, as you probably know, Mr. Speaker, vast amounts of street space in the wake of congestion pricing, turned it over for bus service, for bikes, and for better pedestrian space. We're gonna have an opportunity to start that process in the next two years and see how it works. And I think it's gonna be a tremendous, exciting opportunity for us. I can tell you on the DOT side, it's something we're very excited about. You, you said today how much you love the city. This is gonna be a chance to really transform the city. Do you think that we're prioritizing walking, cycling, and transit, or are we just making improvements? I think it's a sort of pretty important distinction. Well, you know, look, as, as you mentioned, there's no question this is a, not a good year for us on Vision Zero. We are very focused on it and, and grieving heavily for the loss of life we've seen on our streets. But I, I do, you know, I do always want to mention that prior five years, we saw fatalities on our roadways go down by almost a third. When, we, when the de Blasio administration came in in 2013, we had 299 fatalities on the streets of New York. Last year, we had 202. And that was work not only done by DOT, but by NYPD and so many of the advocates and political leaders. It was a real team effort in the city. I agree we need to continue to step that up because we want to see those fatality numbers go down every year. But I think behind that, you have seen you know, redesigns of streets all over the city to make them more bike friendly, to make them more pedestrian friendly, to make them more accessible and safer for people with disabilities. I take it's a fair point, we can always do better to pick up the pace, but that really has been one of the driving forces behind Vision Zero. But do you think we're prioritizing walking and biking, biking and transit, or are we just making improvements? Because it sounds like we're making a lot of improvements, which we are very grateful for, and we've worked with you uh, on many of those improvements locally as council members, but I think what sort of this bill is about is shifting away from car culture, breaking the car culture, and moving more towards prioritizing people who are not in cars and prioritizing pedestrians, cyclists, buses, and mass transit. And I think that's the key distinction that I'm trying to suss out. I mean, I, I think in our designs, we have tried to shift that priority. As we like to say, we are trying to prioritize what we call the more sustainable modes, which is, which is cycling, which is business. It is also buses. And you know, again, when we talk, uh, you know, there's often discussions in our projects where people say, well, we're worried about congestion. Oftentimes, one of the things we're looking at in our projects is, is it a major bus route? And making sure, as was mentioned, I think, by, by Mr. Perlstein, making sure that we can keep those buses moving. But you know, again, I think citywide, this is an area where we can all work together. I mean, we have done a lot to, frankly, start to change the mix on our streets put bus lanes in, we're doing one on 14th Street, for example, where we're basically, other than local pickups and drop-offs, gonna eliminate vehicles altogether. We will be focusing instead on buses and pedestrians. 12th and 13th will be the complementary bike lanes. So we're starting to do that. I'm sure for some in the room, they would like to see the pace go faster, and certainly something we can talk about. I would also just say, I do think there is different appetites for that in different parts of the city, and you know, particularly in parts of the city where mass transit is good, I think that pace is moving rapidly in parts of the city where there are fewer options and more people are auto dependent, perhaps moving at a, at a slower pace. Although I'm proud of in places like Staten Island, we have been really building out a bike network and now we're gonna have borough wide bike share, dockless bike share. And I think that is really gonna start to boost the, the bike culture in Staten Island as well. In terms of road space, has DOT analyzed how much room cars take up and how it compares to the amount of space that pedestrians and people riding bikes take up? Could we actually be accommodating more people if we take space away from cars? We, we, I mean, we absolutely could accommodate more people in there, and I don't know whether we're looking over at Eric to see if we have that number. It's something we may have to get you. There is a famous poster, which I think a lot of people in this room have probably seen, 
which shows a picture of a street and it shows the number of people that single occupancy vehicles can carry and it's some cluster of 20 people. How many people bikes can carry and it's, I don't know, it's 60 people and then how many people buses can carry and it's 100 people. So of course when you prioritize what we call the sustainable modes, you will carry more people. There's no question about it. Do you think we have enough free personal parking in New York City? <laughs> it, it's interesting. Um, we have tried in the past couple of years to both raise parking rates to add more commercial parking uh, to try and I think chip away at sort of the volume of free parking on the streets. There is no question that our curb is very underpriced. Um, and, you know, I would also say it doesn't get a lot of attention, but the projects that we have put on the ground, we have removed a fair amount of parking. You know this well, Mr. Speaker. We've removed hundreds of spaces in your district recently. Uh, we went to a community board last night uh, with a project to put in a bike lane on Central Park West where we announced we are removing 400 spaces, and the audience actually cheered. So um, we were happy to see that. And you know we are also looking to put in uh, alternatives. We have our bike share program, which we are now going to be tripling the size of. We have put car share in as a pilot, and we're looking to potentially expand that. So, and, and of course, as you know, in the larger picture, working with the MTA both to improve bus service uh, on the fast forward plan with Andy Byford, and of course now with congestion pricing to give the MTA the resources it needs. If we're going to encourage people to get out of their cars, we do have to offer them good alternatives, and particularly for New Yorkers who live in the far out distances of the city, they need good mass transit alternatives. Do you think we have enough free parking in New York City? We have too much free parking in New York City. Too much? Too much, yeah. yes. Do you know how many free parking spaces there are in New York City? We estimate about three million. Three million free parking spaces. Uh, how does DOT decide whether a parking space is more important than a bus lane or a bike lane or widening a sidewalk? or adding more dedicated space for deliveries. How does that decision get made? I know it's, of course, it is case by case, depending on the uh, site itself and what's happening there in the context, but what are some of the guiding principles yeah, I'm, that I'm are gonna used? I'm gonna speak a little bit, and then actually I have a couple of experts here who spend a lot of time on the ground, particularly on bus lanes and bike lanes and pedestrian space, and want them to talk about our process. Um, you know, and as you know, again, let's start with the Vision Zero side of the house here, where we're focusing our interventions, looking at where the data tells us, where we see the highest rates of fatalities and seriously injured, and looking at how we can redesign those streets and where we need to repurpose space. Take it for buses, take it for bikes, take it for daylighting, take it for bike parking in pedestrian islands, all the things that we can do to make streets safer, make them more accessible. You know, likewise, we get into sort of the designs we're doing on our bike network. We're building out a bike network, and those questions arise there, as well as with all the bus lanes. So I think with that, actually, I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let Sean and Eric talk in a little more detail about how our process works. Sure, so when we're looking at bike lanes, we specifically protected bike lanes, we do often have to take um, uh, parking spots to make the design work. Um, and we don't only look at the spaces that we have to take to get those safety elements included for pedestrian islands or protection or visibility of the cyclist. We then look at the parking regulations that are left in place. So we look to change those regulations to make sure that they are uh, tailored to the curb needs of that neighborhood, whether it be residential needs for loading for commercial. And then we also look around uh, the neighborhood to see if there's other places we can make adjustments for that parking. So we're as we do a bike lane design, we're actually going and rethinking the curb completely, um, curves that haven't been rethought for uh, generations and making sure that the parking is there uh, for the needs of the street and not worrying too much about what we're taking away, ensuring that what we're leaving is actually functional. And, 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 and similarly on, on bus lanes and, and Vision Zero, we want to make sure that whatever we put out there actually functions. You, there's some, you can draw a nice plan on a piece of paper but if you're not making sure that we take care of the grocery store that needs to get its deliveries or a, a facility with people with disabilities that needs to be able to get uh, pickups and drop-offs, those vehicles are going to be in the lanes whether we want them there or not and have a, a very legitimate public purpose, we think, in accommodating those. So w that isn't a reason to not do a project. It's a reason to be thoughtful and careful and really look to make sure that sometimes it means that we have to go around the corner, as Sean said, or sometimes it means that we have to move the bus lane one lane in so that we can maintain some access at the curb. But we do really want to look at those block by block and not move so quickly that we can't actually take care of the things along the way that we need to do. 
Commissioner, why do you think we've, we're seeing such a sharp increase in deaths? It's a good question and obviously one that we've had our experts looking at. I mean, I'll, I'll talk a bit about of the few of the factors we're seeing. While fully admitting, I don't know that we can totally explain. I mean, you know, one thing we see with fatalities is they can be somewhat weather dependent. And we've had a very mild winter, which means more activity on the streets, more driving, more people out. When we've had very snowy winters, actually we see that fatalities go down. We have seen, unfortunately, a raft of crashes in which we had multiple fatalities. That's unusual, but we've had some of those this year. You know, we are also monitoring a trend which is something that is, seems to be happening at the national level, which is the fleet mix in the United States is changing. People are more and more giving up regular sedans and moving to SUVs. And when you have collisions with SUVs, unfortunately, they tend to be more fatal. The, sort of the center of gravity on the SUV hits a, can potentially hit a pedestrian in a more vulnerable spot. They're higher up. They sometimes have less ability to see pedestrians around them. So we're looking to see you know, if the changing fleet mix of the city is having some effect. But I, I do want to emphasize we are you know, tremendously grieving the, the rise in fatalities we're seeing this year. We're you know, particularly huddling with NYPD to talk about are there places we need to get out and do better education and enforcement. We are moving as aggressively as we can with installing the new speed cameras. The mayor has tasked us with installing 40 new cameras a month in the coming months. So we're hoping that all these things will help to, to address what we're seeing on the streets. One of the biggest uh, motivations I've had in introducing this bill is changing, is changing how we engage with communities. And you've talked a lot about this in your testimony and in the answer to uh, the aforementioned questions. I've seen uh, with my own eyes again and again uh, that without a comprehensive vision, people can't be expected to understand the true importance of a project. They'll feel like you are foisting this upon my local block or community. Uh, without understanding the broader context involved of having sort of a master plan of how it all fits together. And have you ever considered doing a Vision, Steer Vision Zero-like campaign to educate New Yorkers about why everyone benefits from transit upgrades? It, it's, it's, you raise a very good question, and one that I think we've thought a lot about. I, in my five and a half years, have done now, I think, probably close to well over 100 town halls and walkthroughs and... and testimonies and so have had a lot of interaction with the public in all different corners of the city and really seen, I think, the different ways that people approach this issue. And I think there's no question that sometimes presenting a grander plan can be very powerful. For me, we really saw that with Vision Zero. In a lot of places where for years there had been resistance to certain types of projects, when you framed it in a whole new way, that it was going to be about saving lives, it it resonated powerfully with yes. people all over the city. There's no question about that. Yep. But I have also seen, you know, some people respond very much to sort of a grand plan for some. Transportation is intensely local. It is very much about their particular route to school or to work, and the grand plans, it, to the extent that we have them, they don't always particularly like them. But I think, as I said in my testimony, we're, we're certainly open to working with you all if you think there are better ways to package our plans to educate the public. I mean, I and my teams are pretty much out every single night trying to do that, but again, a task we approach with humility. I'm sure there are ways we can do it better and obviously happy to work particularly with elected officials who bring obviously local leadership and, and local respect in, in the bargain. I think that is something that we should think about because given these really incredible improvements that you've outlined that your team has done over the last five and a half years, building on some of the work that was done by the previous administration and going even further and deeper, I think educating the public about how these improvements really how it does benefit them, their safety, their, not just from a Vision Zero style-like campaign that has been, I think, enormously successful, and I'm so glad that you all have undertaken it, but sort of shifting that even further to transit upgrades generally and why it makes sense for your community, having that conversation about how to do that, I think would be a sort of helpful next step 
uh, in evolution in this process. Well, and I, 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 you know, just to underscore the point, I mean, that's part of why the, the mayor released the Better Buses Action Plan, and we took it upon ourselves to then work with the City Hall to create a task force for precisely that reason, because I think we felt like we were struggling a bit to present the larger vision on why we need to reimagine the city's bus network on you know, what it means to the millions of New Yorkers who rely on buses, who those people are, and why, you know, yes, maybe you should stop and let the bus get past. So, so we agree, I think there, and we're happy to say we're having council participation, including the chairman, I think that's a great. And then one thing we have done that I mentioned in my testimony that I think we would like to do more of, we created what we call a street ambassador program, and we're very proud of it because it's, it's you know, basically enthusiastic, very knowledgeable young people. They speak multiple languages. They come from communities all over the city. And we've really been deploying them to, to sort of get away from what is sort of the traditional mode that we often talk about projects in town hall meetings or community board meetings, but instead have our street ambassadors get on the bus and talk to bus riders, stand at the bus stop, go to the local merchants, just stand on a street corner and hear from regular New Yorkers as they're going about their day what we can do better, and I think try and engage in that education process. I think that's something we certainly could do more of, though. I mean, I should have mentioned it before, but since we're talking, uh, since you just mentioned the work, uh, the working group on buses, uh, and you don't have to comment on this, but uh, you know, I, I'm really sad to see you leaving the MTA board. I think you've been uh, one of the best uh, MTA board members. I think you've been clear and level-headed and thoughtful and uh, with a huge command of the uh, balancing act that needs to happen and pointing out the major deficiencies that have existed for a very long time at the MTA while looking out for the city's interests on a board where the city's outnumbered significantly with only four appointments. I think you've really, uh, really been a clarion call uh, in your time on the board. So I know that you, are, uh, you will not leave the board until your successor is confirmed by the state senate. Uh, and when until the governor actually lets that happen, but um, I, I'm sad to see you go, and I'm well, grateful for the leadership that you've uh, shown in your time on the MTA board. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and you know, look, thank you. Obviously, we read with great interest your vision on potentially how the city could someday even have a much greater role in, in managing New York City Transit. Um, it is not an easy place to be the MTA board. I did it for five years. I really enjoyed the experience and was glad to be a part of it, but I think now it's a good chance for uh, fresh members to come on, and obviously, uh, you know, Commissioner Bob Lynn and, and Dan Zarilli, who runs the city's resiliency program, will be terrific candidates, and just my office is gonna continually to work closely with them, to staff them, as well as Veronica Vanterpool and David Jones. You know, I will still always be very involved in MTA affairs. I, I speak with Pat Foy and Andy Byford almost every day, so we will always have a close relationship with that agency. Thank you. Are there any other changes to community planning or the review process that you think could be improved? You talked about the balancing act of doing all the outreach and engagement that you do, and sometimes that slows projects up. Uh, but it's also important to get community feedback because sometimes, as you said, it really improves the project and makes it better. So are there any general changes to that engagement process that you can see from your experience over the last five and a half years? I mean, again, I think, you know, we have some sort of mandated requirements about steps and notifications we have to take. And, you know, as I said in my testament, and quite frankly, you know, the council has put a lot on us in terms of reporting and other things. It, it's starting to add up. But that's a question also that I think should be a dialogue. I mean, I would love to, ha you know, engage the community boards on that. I hear from a lot of them individually. We have some amazing people at our community boards doing tremendous work. You know, a lot of them doing it on a volunteer basis. I think sometimes they feel pretty overwhelmed at the volume of things that are coming at them, not just on the transportation front, but on other fronts as well. I think it would be great to have that discussion with them and the elected officials. How do we maximize the input so we get the best possible projects, but not slow things down unduly or get lost in process that isn't adding value? There, there are some community boards that want more aggressive treats. I can tell you, uh, I see my community dear, dear, board four. I know. I see a, my dear, dear friend <laughs> who I love tremendously, she, Christine. She's Berté. a delightful outlier, though. Uh, she is the best. Uh, Christine's amazing, um, and uh, there are some community boards, like Community Board Four in Manhattan, that want more aggressive treatments than DOT is willing to do. Have you ever gone further than initially planned because of community support? 
I mean, we certainly have. I mean, there are, and look, there are cases where the community board has wanted us to go further. We usually go further if that's what the community board wants. And look, there are cases where we have overruled community boards. We do do that. I mean, I, I, I like to work with community boards when I can, but you know, one of those cases, for example, is currently under litigation up in the Bronx. It's a safety project, Morris Park. So community boards are you know, entities we work closely with, but we don't always agree. Um, you know, I would, I would say, you know, your district is a very special one. You and I have talked about this. There's no other district in this city that has the transportation facilities you do, the density you do. It's, it's an extraordinary piece of the city. And one where I hear you, if, if you want us to go further, and, and Christine is an amazing supporter of ours, we love working with her, we're ready to do so. That isn't, you know, in some, in some parts of the city, the community boards are, are suing us, so uh, it, it can vary from neighborhood to neighborhood. Do you think that the feedback DOT gets from community board meetings is really representative of the community at large? Or do you see sort of a higher percentage of drivers or higher income folks that speak out? I think that's something that I'm seeing changing. And it's an interesting question I get from council members and, and borough presidents, because after all, you all do get to appoint the people who are on the community boards. And I, I have seen that you know there is starting to be sort of a fresh generation of people that are coming on to community boards in many neighborhoods, you know, maybe less focused on auto ownership and more focused on cycling and vision zero. Um, and I don't know the community boards are perfectly representative, but, but again, it is the system the city has. If there are changes we want to make, including potentially how the appointment process works, and I know that I think there have been some recent changes made in terms of term limits, you know, happy to discuss those. That probably involves other parts of the administration as well. We're just, we touch community boards on our projects, but obviously many city agencies touch community boards on a number of, of different fronts. Do you think we're in a mass transit crisis? I think I think I would say this, and I again I work very closely with New York City uh, Transit President Andy Byford. I think the city was facing a real crisis uh, in the not too distant past, but I, I think we are really seeing some encouraging signs. I think he and his team, with an infusion of resources, both that the city gave them and that they got up in Albany, have started to turn the page on some of the service challenges that, this, that was plaguing the subway system, not to say there isn't more work to be done, and, and I think President Byford would be the first to admit it. I think now, too, obviously, when congestion pricing and the other funding sources that Albany passed in the budget you know, start to come online, that is also going to make a big difference. It will enable the MTA to get back to doing the kind of deep maintenance and capital work that they need to do on a system which in many places is over 100 years old. When I asked about the mass transit crisis, I, I was um, thinking particularly about buses, and I know you've mentioned the, the working group. Do you think that your bus plan is enough to turn the tide? You think it's aggressive enough as it could be to significantly improve service? I mean, I think so. The mayor has set, you know, what to us is an aggressive goal, which to improve bus speeds by 25 percent by 2020. That is in concert with the MTA. I mean. DOT is part of the puzzle. I mean, we are the controllers of the city streets, of building bus lanes, of doing part of transit signal priority. But there are pieces that are also sort of in the MTA's wheelhouse, doing effective dispatching, having enough buses on the road to meet demand, all door boarding. So together, the two agencies, I think, have a lot of work to do. And you know, I think it's a fair question. For us, this is going to be setting a very aggressive pace, and again, part of why we pulled together a task force, because I have found in my time, um, I have never, you know, I've never met a New Yorker who didn't say that they wanted to see improved bus service. I think it's a goal that everybody shares, but I've also sort of never seen a bus project in which there weren't a lot of concerns to work through. To improve, to improve bus service, you normally need to take away travel lanes and parking and restrict turns and do a lot of and restrict curb access. A lot of things, as you know now from particularly our work together on 14th Street, you can get there, but it, it, it takes some work to bring people along. And I think, as Eric has said, make sure you get the design that, that really will work best it can. And I, don't know, I want Eric, Eric and his team had a big hand in putting this plan together. Sure, and a lot of what we're trying to do is not just rack up miles for miles' sake, but to make sure we're doing it in the places that are most targeted. So a lot like with Vision Zero, where we took a very data-driven approach, we're trying to do that now with buses, and we've been given a treasure trove of information as the MTA and New York City Transit have put GPS on all their buses, 
and now we're in the, the drinking from the fire hose stage where there's so much information coming in, we want to make sure we're using it most effectively to target our, our treatments where they're most needed. But it, as the commissioner said, those treatments are the, the places where the buses are slowest often end up being in some of the most crucial places in every community. They're the, the main street, the commercial corridor in every community, the places that we want to see thriving. So we don't want to, to shut them down just to make sure that the bus goes faster. We want to, make, to get that bus moving faster, but do it in a way that supports local businesses, that supports neighborhood access and neighborhood needs at the same time. And you know, not come through with the Robert Moses approach of, of just do this wherever the, we need to. Do it in, we want to make sure we're doing it in a community consultative way that actually achieves what we want. I, I, I want to just add one other thing that Eric and his team are working on. Another thing that the MTA is undertaking, they started in Staten Island, they're, they're now up in the Bronx and Queens is next. They're doing, for the first time in often 50 or 60 years, a holistic look at the bus routes in each borough. And in Staten Island, it made some real dramatic changes to the way express buses run and you know, saved a lot of time for a lot of riders, but had to work through a lot of the issues in cases, for example, of removing bus stops, which can speed up buses, but, but often proves pretty unpopular on the ground. So we're also working hand in glove with them on that. That has the potential to be, I think, pretty transformative, requires them to change the way they deploy buses, their drivers, a whole lot of work on there. And, and then on our work, making sure that we're doing what we can to help straighten out routes to, again, ban turns and do other things that can make the buses flow more quickly. It, it's, it can be pretty granular work, but it's gonna be, this is gonna be an exciting project when we get through all five boroughs. Do you know how often bus lanes get blocked with drop-offs and deliveries or folks just parking in the lanes? Do I you mean, keep track look, of that? Well, I, everyone tweets to me about it, so I, I get a pretty good sense every day. Thousands of people let me know. Um, it is no question a huge problem in the city. And look, one, obviously, the mayor has talked about and recognized that we need to do better. As part of his announcement on buses, we are now creating uh, NYP seven tow teams that are going around and working closely with NYPD where are the bus lanes where we're seeing the most egregious behavior. And I have seen them out, I have seen them out on the streets towing. As I mentioned in my testimony, you know, we're also uh, looking up to Albany to Senator Kruger and Assemblymember Rosick, because right now we only have the ability to deploy bus lane cameras in 16 routes in a city that has hundreds of bus routes. Obviously, if we had the ability to use cameras, that would be ideal, because NYPD is stepping up their enforcement, but they're not going to be everywhere in every bus route all the time. Automated enforcement, I think, is sort of the future of where we need to go, and, and we're, it's a priority for us up in Albany. We're, we're, we're keeping our eyes on Do we currently keep track of it? Keep track of? If a bus lane is blocked. It's not currently data that we capture. It's really hard to capture I mean, I, it. I, yeah, I mean, I, th I think PD captures when they write a summons, and I, I don't have that data. I can get it for you, but I, I, I won't deny it is a pretty regular problem all over the city. Can you define a protected bike lane for me? Don't you think that the term protected is a little misleading? If someone told you that something is protected, wouldn't you think there's something more than paint? That's what I'm trying to get to. Right. I mean, I'm, I'll talk a little bit. I'm going to turn it over to the expert here, to Sean. And I know this has been an area of some dispute with the advocacy community. And I think the ideal is what we would call a parking protected bike lane, where you can have vehicles. I think that is the highest level of protection. Or in some cases, you often see them in greenways and other areas, a set of bollards or jersey bears. It's not always, unfortunately, what we can do uh, in every street in New York, and I'll sort of let Sean talk about the different gradations. But John, tell me how you currently define a protected bike lane, how DOT defines a protected bike lane. So the protected bike lanes are um, either uh, have a line of a hard barrier, parked cars or a jersey barrier, or some form of, some form of vertical delineation. So that be a flexible post or um, one of our quick curbs, something like that. So it's either a hard barrier or the vertical delineation. And then the third category, category of protected lanes are off street lanes, lanes that go through parks um, or some of our greenways. So uh, we put a lot of thought into what kind of barrier we can use on these corridors. Um, it, has, it comes down a lot to maintenance, keeping those lanes usable 365 days a year, making sure that they're plowable. Uh, making sure that they are sweepable, making sure that we can maintain them. So that maintenance piece, oh, and also making sure that fire and access can be uh, maintained in those lanes. So if we don't have the width, we often go with 
the more vertical, flexible posts to make sure that people can um, do what they need to do to keep the lane uh, maintained and clear. Do you, uh, if you were a cyclist, would you feel safe in a protected lane that was not uh, the parking protected lane? Yeah, so most of our, uh, the lanes that aren't parking protected also have a buffer from moving vehicles. They have other treatments uh, at the intersections to keep them uh, safe as they travel down the corridor. It definitely feels different when you're cycling on a parking protected lane versus a uh, Jersey um, flexible delineator protected lane, but those safety elements are built into all of our protected lane projects. So the ones that you just outlined, are they all physically protected? Yeah, if we, if we count something as a protected bike lane, it either has a line of physical uh, barriers or the vertical protection. So vertical. right now, a, a, a bike lane that is just green paint with no physical jersey barrier or a parking protected barrier, that's not considered a protected bike lane? Correct. So on some of our crosstown routes this year, you'll see it's reflected on our bike map. Not every block is counted as a protected bike lane. There are blocks around Madison uh, Square Park, for example. It's just green with a buffer that's not counted as a protected lane. That is a green lane, curbside buffered bike lane. So, in, Commissioner, in your testimony, you outlined the, the uh, amount of new bike lanes that DOT has been installing annually. I can't find the number. Tell me the number. It's about an average of 20. 20, 20 miles. 20 and protected, pr yeah. And how many of those miles are protected? Th no, 20 protected. It's about 60, 60 bike lane miles altogether. And look, I, I will just say, you know, we, we understand and share the desire to build as many protected lanes as we can. They are the safest and most comfortable. But all bike infrastructure improves safety on the streets. Definitely, so, but people are dying, and no, no question. And so and we you know, talked you, about that. You, I just you, you can see here sort of how we have picked up the pace of protected bike lane miles, and you know this year we're going to try and exceed what we did last year, and we will try to do that again the year after that. I understand you want to make that target much bigger. Again, I think that to do that, as we sort of said in the testimony, we do now need to start to think of other pieces of the puzzle, be it sanitation, be it FDNY, be it PD, be it our contracting capacity, et cetera. Have you all ever tried to sketch out, and I think that illustration from 1997 to 2019 is, tells you a lot at what has happened in 22 years on a bike network, a bike map network in New York City, but have you all ever tried as an agency to fully sketch out what a full bike network would look like for the entire city of New York? We have. Um, it is sort of a, I'd say it's a product. Which uh, safe is that sketch in <laughs> and how does it well, get shared? I'd, I'd say it's, it's a product in progress. Um, and, you know, again, something happy to come back and sort of talk more about. You know, we, we sort of want to balance putting the grand scheme on the map with also moving at a sort of in lockstep with local communities to pick what the actual streets would look like. But I, I understand, I think, from this hearing in your bill, that is something we should certainly come back and engage with you all on. I think it is something we could come together on reasonably quickly. So I'm just looking at a, a statement that um, DOT gave to a Streets blog uh, at the end of last year. And in the statement, DOT offered its definition of a bike lane, a protected bike lane, and it says, this is from DOT, quote, a protected bike lane is a path intended for use of bicycles that is physically separated from motorized vehicle traffic by an open space, vertical delineation, or barrier. So the question is, what I was asking is that vertical delineation uh, of, of, of paint or something else, is that considered, uh, I, I think, I'm, I'm not fully understanding. I think, I think by, by vertical delineation, we mean like a- The Jersey barriers? Like a, or like a delinear, What's, delineator. What about like, the open- Like you would see- like What you, about, I, I meant, sorry, the open space. The open by space is the third category I mentioned of uh, lanes that are in parks, greenways. They're protected because they're not on street. They're protected by green space or open space in the park. Got it. I want to end with accessibility and then I want to turn it back over to the chair and I want to thank Councilmember Rose and uh, Chair Rodriguez for being very patient with my uh, long list of questions and I want to thank you for uh, just um, uh, being so great and being here today and answering these. Okay, so I want to talk about accessibility. Our transit record in terms of accessibility is pretty 
deplorable. I don't mean that towards you. I mean that generally as a city, the history of our city, and you spoke about the work on pedestrian ramps that the city is undergoing and the enormous cost involved, but how it's the right thing to do to have an accessible city uh, for New Yorkers that have mobility impairments or visually impaired in getting around the city. It's not just the MTA, in my opinion, it's the entire city. The MTA is a whole different uh, deplorable ball of wax as it relates to how inaccessible our subways have been. I can't imagine trying to get around with a physical or visual impairment, and there are so many New Yorkers, some of whom are here today, who have to navigate the streets every single day where it is not done in a way that, it, that makes it easy for them, and it's really unsafe for them uh, in trying to transverse and get around uh, the city. Not even 3% of signaled intersections have accessible pedestrian signals, and our population, as was discussed by the AARP testimony uh, in the first panel is growing older every day, so this is going to get exacerbated year after year. Do you agree that we have a moral responsibility to make our streets and sidewalks fully accessible for all New Yorkers? I, I, I certainly do, Mr. Speaker, and I know this is a topic you're very passionate about, and, and I even want to go further because from DOT's point of view, we're lucky we're joined here today actually by Kwame Arroyo, who is our D disability advisor, who he works across all areas of the agency, because it's not just streets and sidewalks, it's ferries, it's all our traffic operations, it's, it's, it's our, we're looking now in terms of our bike share system, are there ways we can have accessible bike share? So there's so many different elements. Um, but there is also, of course, you know, sort of the practical questions of resource technology, litigation in some of these cases, and I think APSs is a good example. We have tripled the pace at which we're doing them. I'm the first to admit I think we, we, we will at some point need to go further still, but we are also monitoring now on the APS front that, you know, other cities are starting to do pilots with other potential ways to do it, because it's fairly costly. It's thousands of dollars per intersection to install the hardware at each corner. You put sort of two APSs at each corner. It can be eight per intersection. Other cities are starting to look potentially at are there handheld or mobile devices, which may even be more accurate and easier to deploy than, and, and much quicker to deploy than sort of the system of APSs that we're installing now. Likewise, we have gotten a grant from the federal government to do a connected vehicle pilot. We are also looking there at are there technologies that will enable the vehicles, again, to communicate with devices that not just people with disabilities, but anyone could have. So I agree there's more that needs to be done there, but that is also a field in which there are a lot of potentially exciting technological developments which may make our ability to do the work go more quickly and be less expensive. It's too soon to say, but, but we're sort of looking across that spectrum as well. I would say, in general, on the accessibility front, there are a lot of exciting potential technologies out there, a lot of them unproven, a lot of them being piloted around the country and, and around the world, and, and we're wanting to make sure that we, we stay on top of those as well. What's the hardest part of doing this job that you do? <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> um, you know, look, I, I would say this, is, this has been the opportunity of a lifetime, and I, I love, Mr. Speaker, that you started this hearing by saying how much you love the city. I feel the same way. I love the city, and having the opportunity to serve has been remarkable. You know, what is the hardest part of the job? Probably a year like this, in which, you know, after so many years of, of the heartening experience of seeing fatalities go down, to have a year in which fatalities start to go up, I, I, I can't tell you how personally difficult that is, not only for me, but for the whole team. You know, it makes us want to redouble our efforts, but, you know, those are certainly some of the days when we hear of a terrible crash, one maybe that, you know, involves a child that, that, that break our hearts, and I'd say that's the hardest part of the job. And what can we do to help? Well, I, listen, I think this is a terrific discussion today, and obviously we're, we appreciate your leadership and the chairman's leadership. We're, we're ready to engage. I think, I think you're hearing a willingness on our side. If there are ways collectively we can pick up the pace on how we're doing things, we, we want to work with you on that, and we appreciate your interest. And Polly, I want to thank you uh, again for uh, how thoughtful you always are, for always being willing to 
work with us, even sometimes when it's difficult and painful and not easy and painstaking. Your team similarly has uh, conducted themselves that way and uh, nearly every interaction that I've had with them over the last five and a half years, I am supremely grateful um, for that, not just a superficial level of engagement, but a real level of wanting to understand neighborhood by neighborhood, how to work with local communities in making improvements that are gonna save people's lives and make our city a more livable city, a better city, a city that we can continue to love even more. And so uh, I'm tremendously grateful for your leadership. My goal in this piece of legislation, as you know, as you testified to, as I've outlined in my opening statement and in these questions today, is to keep pushing the envelope, keep going deeper, keep going further, shifting our mindset away from private automobiles and cars and trucks and moving more towards mass transit, towards pedestrians, towards cyclists, towards having greater economic justice and environmental justice and uh, having less traffic violence in New York City and trying to figure out ways that we can do that that are achievable, that are sometimes hard to actually hit that benchmark, but will push us to go even further. And I feel a pretty confident that with a partnership uh, with you and your team, with the leadership of our amazing chair who has shown leadership on all of these issues for the last five and a half years uh, citywide uh, and with my deep commitment to doing this that we can continue to improve the city to make it even safer and better so that at the end of uh, hopefully you'll stay for the next two and a half years but at the end of the eight years of you being DOT commissioner and my being in the city council and the chair chairing this committee for eight years that we will have real significant accomplishments to point do not just on what we've accomplished so far in five and a half years, but even deeper, quicker, uh, more transformative changes and accomplishments that we can point to together. And I look forward to doing that with you. And I'm really grateful for your partnership and for your leadership. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to turn it back over to our chair. Well, thank you, Speaker, for you know that vision and putting together the master plan. It, and as we have said before, I have seen a lot of accomplishments and the fact that even some members that used to be transportation entity now working with DOT, those are all people that have been a pedestrian and cyclist advocate, being now working in that transition, playing another role. It's like those of us that have been grass organized and now have to be holding a public offices. I think that gives us the opportunity for us to work together and be able to see, you know, our opportunity to even have a more ambitious plan. And I, I, one of the areas where I have some concern is about the Vision Zero educational fund. And I wonder if even the increase of fatality that we have this year also can be also related for the lack of resources for DOT uh, to put more money, to put resources on billboard, on radio, and TV. Uh, uh, something that we were able to do it up to like two years ago <clears throat> when the council was allocating from three to five million dollars. So how much do you see the value of DOT having the resources to invest in the Vision Zero Education Fund? Something that is clear, I'm talking about the last year compared for the last one. Since in the BNT negotiation, that money was removed, even though DOT, you know, you can say, yeah, some resources that we're doing somewhere going through a community board, but those advertising are not happening in the back of the buses. Those advertising are not happening in the billboard. So how important was to have those resources to carry on those campaign for the Vision Zero Education? I think we found, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you because we know you have been a, a big champion and supporter of the Vision Zero Education Funds. And 
you know, I think we made it, I think we thought it made a difference, and we certainly, part of how we looked at that is we did focus groups and opinion surveys, and, you know, we did see that when we did those ad campaigns, it did raise awareness in, among New Yorkers. We worked with you, obviously, to help make sure we were getting those campaigns out in multiple languages, and I think I understand that that is, is probably a source of discussion right now in the current budget negotiations. We will be, just as I mentioned in my testimony, since the city is about to start in exponential growth in our speed camera program, and I want to mention it here today, starting July 11th, um, our speed cameras will be operating, our existing speed cameras will be operating, the, the number of hours will be doubled, and then each month we're going to be adding 40 new speed cameras in locations all over the city, and we want to make sure we're getting the word out to New Yorkers. These speed cameras are going to be everywhere, and you're going to need to drive at a safe speed. We're going to be doing a big ad campaign and public awareness campaign around that, and of course it will also reference Vision Zero. But I think we agree that the, the education campaign has been very important, and again, I think perhaps it's something that's currently under discussion in the budget negotiations. But we do agree that in this past budget, there was not resources for the Vision Zero Education. There weren't in the budget. DOT, we did use some of our own internal resources, but it's true, we didn't have the same, the same resources we'd had in previous budgets. Yeah. You're correct, Mr. Chairman. So I just hope that again that, that as, as we continue, like, having this conversation that we can be able to look at it. Can, can you share like with us, you know, what was the difference in speaker? I don't, I don't know if you recall, but what we're addressing is up to two years ago, there was from three to $5 million at the designated for the Vision Zero Education Fund. And it was with that money that they were able to, based on what I saw, based on the information that we share, they were able to use the billboard, to use, put advertising in the Latinos, in the mainstream media, doing that part, educating New Yorkers about the benefit of driving safety, slow down, those benefits that we're talking about. So the last year, what we get from, and this is not the agency, you know, even though everyone get involved, but what we heard across the, this building was, we would do it internally. But the reality is that DOT, they don't have those resources. And last year, they didn't have, you know, even though, and you could see walking in the street, seeing the buses, seeing the billboard, those level of educational features, they were not in our street. And for me, the fact, and I don't know that, you know, we don't have any data to say, oh, how the lack of investment in the Vision Zero Education Fund happening at the same time that we have seen an increase of crashes in the street. I always say that one thing that I give credit to Bloom, Mayor Bloomberg was, you know, the whole educational component on and the anti-smoking campaign. When people saw those advertising in the TV, people thought twice about should I get into smoking, yes or no. And you did a, a, a lot of job because you, you, you used to chair that committee uh, before becoming the speaker. So, I, you know, since we are in days or at every time for the BNT, hopefully, you know, we can get, it doesn't matter how, but I would like to see how DOT get the resources that they need to be able to really be able to do the educational piece on Vision Zero. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Again, I think that's part of the budget negotiations. We have some of our city hall colleagues here, so I, I presume they'll, they'll take your message back. Okay. On, on, <clears throat> on page three, or your testimony, uh, you highlight how the agency, in the second paragraph, uh, you overall you say the agency managed and maintained the city 6,000 miles of street and 12,000 miles of sidewalks. Can you define what is managed when it comes to the sidewalks? Well, it's a good question, because it's a fair point that a good amount of the sidewalks are actually privately owned by the building managers, but the city is actually legally responsible for all the pedestrian ramps and now for making sure that they all comply with the ADA. The city is also responsible for the curb. It is, it is a bit of a complicated system. As you know, the city also does a good amount of sidewalk repair in places where sidewalks are damaged by city things that happen, including tree roots pushing up, and the city is now investing a good amount of resources in NYCHA sidewalk repair as well. 
We know that's been a big area of focus for, for NYCHA, a lot of sidewalks in very bad condition there, and over the years, we've been increasing the amount of money we put into helping to improve NYCHA sidewalks. I, look, I, I, I introduced a legislation uh, recently calling for giving DOT all the lead management of the sidewalk. I feel that right now, that's not where we are. I feel that right now, there's a lot of confusion. Is that consuming affair? Is it DOT? Is the Department of Building? And by the way, I would like to thank all the agencies that also help with the uh, sidewalk that, that I've been highlighting, the one at San Nicolas Avenue between 180 and 181st, that finally uh, uh, that sidewalk is open for pedestrians. But I think that right now, what I have seen based on all those uh, questions that we address is that we have limited responsibility, or the agency have limited responsibility. And being the sidewalk, the most important venue for our New Yorkers to walk, I think someone has to be responsible. And if this means that consuming affair, department of building, and whoever had to coordinate with you guys or whoever is responsible, but so, so right now if we say, let's all the hearing yes about the sidewalk, there's not an entity that can say, we're responsible for the whole area. So I hope that, you know, that we can, as part of this plan of, on, or, you know, separate it, we continue, I, I would like to have conversation with you to see how we get DOT to take the lead controlling and ma real managing it, the sidewalk. It, it is a very fair criticism. We have a very complicated sidewalk system. And, and I will say, as we were undertaking designing our plan to make all the ped ramps in this city accessible, it is one of the things we sort of realized on any given day in our thousands of miles of sidewalks, utilities, private building owners, a bunch of different entities are working on cutting open and changing our sidewalks. It is a difficult system to manage. I've talked to a lot of my counterparts in other cities. Most other cities have a similarly complicated sidewalk system. Certainly an area where I think there's, there's room for improvement to the extent that the city takes over more and more of the sidewalks. Obviously, there's a, there's a cost associated with that. I think that we need to look at sidewalk like, you know, it's like our street. So we're thinking about where are the seven million New Yorkers don't own vehicles. Only 1.4 million New Yorkers own vehicles. So we're talking about that more than seven million, they just rely on our buses, they take the buses, they take the train, they get the bike, and they walk in the sidewalk. So I, just, I know that we had a spirit, so yeah. I just think that it's time right now, as part of this comprehensive plan, to look at sidewalk as the most important area that we need to clean it. Like, when I see around Ninth Avenue uh, and see how pedestrians, they are forced to walk in the, bi in the bike lane because there's not enough space. And it's a challenge that we have as a city. We got 65 million tourists that came here last year. So, I'm not saying that it is an easy problem, but I hope, again, that we can... Uh, well, I, I'd like to talk, respond to that, and I know, Mr. Chairman, you've had some legislation on that, and I think between Sean and Eric, we have tried to give a lot of thought to the question of where are places where we can expand sidewalks, improve the pedestrian experience. As you say, it is a challenge. I mean, I've, I've often talked to communities, they say, well, make the sidewalk bigger, and to which I say, okay, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be making the road narrower, and they'll say, well, wait a minute, we, we didn't mean for you to do that. Um, it is a trade-off, but let's talk, because we've had, I think, some good success, particularly in some of the denser parts of Manhattan, where exactly we see pedestrians spilling onto the street and reclaiming more of that space for pedestrians. Sure, yeah. We have, um, you know, on 7th Avenue between Times Square and Penn Station last year, we dramatically uh, increased those sidewalk widths. We've been doing that in Flushing. Um, we're adding new tools to our plaza toolkit. We're doing more shared streets to give more space back to pedestrians in the denser parts of the city, sort of formalizing what we already see pedestrians doing. Um, we're looking at 8th Avenue right now, how we can reclaim some of that space for pedestrians there. Um, so we have a bunch of different ways, whether it's widening a sidewalk, creating a shared street, creating a pedestrian plaza, of really going into places where there's uh, an overabundance of pedestrians and trying to reclaim that space. I, I, I just hope that during the time that we continue serving in government, especially in this administration, because my thing is that 
we need to work with what we have in our hand. And what we know is that there is a leadership in this administration that understand, you know, a, the opportunity that we have to turn our city as the most walkable one. And I feel that it would take not only redesigning our streets, but also it would take investments on educating uh, New Yorkers also who not necessarily uh, uh, work 20, 25 miles away from where they live because that's a challenge to, to promote more New Yorkers to walk. It's about increasing the incentive to the private sector to create good job in underserved community mm -hmm. so that people, they don't have to travel an hour and a half to go to work. So it's also about accessibility. And, and that's, you know, one of my question is, what is your assessment that you have done with uh, challenges that we still have to make, especially intersections, more accessible for people with disability? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a bit about that, and I think I also want Sean and Eric to just talk in general about the design process. And I think, as you heard in my testimony today, New York City is undertaking, I think, a dramatic um, transformation of the accessibility of our corners. And that starts with, as I said in my testimony, something that the advocates have long wanted us to do and we're now undertaking, which is a comprehensive survey of every single uh, curb cut in New York City, and we, th we estimate that to be about 320,000, but that number may go up. And that means using LIDAR and other management tools to get the most precise set of dimensions and characteristics so that as we repair and upgrade these ped ramps, we're bringing them up to full ADA compliance. And we're going further than that, which is first we're committed to doing that throughout the entire city. It's a big project. It's going to take years to do and billions of dollars, but then also committing the resources and the manpower behind ensuring that we maintain those ped ramps as well. It's going to be a big challenge for New York, but it's something I think we are really excited to roll up our sleeves and get to work on. We've started the work. We've hired several hundred people now to start getting out on the street, and hopefully in many of your neighborhoods you've seen, you've seen our crews hard at work. I, mean, I want to talk a little bit just in general because Eric and Sean do a lot of work of sort of our bigger, more comprehensive street improvement projects and how they incorporate accessibility, and they, they work with Quimel, who's, who's sitting right here with us. So uh, last year, we did 140 street improvement projects throughout the city. Um, many of those were on our Vision Zero Priority Corridors, and many of those focused on intersection redesigns, whether it was, um, and this is on top of the work we're already doing to improve accessibility, but whether it was finding ways to shorten crosswalks through neck downs, adding pedestrian islands, removing legs of traffic from an intersection to uh, make it clear where pedestrians should travel and make it easier for them to cross the intersection. Um, our planners are always looking at ways to uh, enhance the pedestrian experience in all of these projects, whether it be a bus project, a lot of them come along with um, pedestrian uh, boarding islands, or a bike project has a pedestrian safety island. So each of our modes comes along with thinking about the pedestrian and how to improve that, um, their experience, particularly at the intersection. Do, do you have any, as you share the data about the, the numbers of sidewalk and other information like that. Do, what do we have, and if you don't have a, if you have a grade, if you can share now, if not, how many intersections do we have in the city of New York throughout the five world? I think that's a good question. We have, we have 13,000 signalized intersection, but we have a much larger non-signalized number. Someone can probably get that. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was remiss in mentioning one thing about this comprehensive survey we're doing of all the the pedestrian ramps in the city. That is all going to be online. It is going to be interactive. It is going to show all the survey results we found, categorized with an ability for people to go in and file complaints where they want to see work done. So I think it is going to be a very state-of-the-art, transparent, and interactive system. Oh, I just got the number. 40,000 intersections in total. I'm sure that's an approximate number. but So, so my, my, I, I would say as we planning for the present and the future, you know, and thinking about the one million New Yorkers with disability, and it's a matter of time when, especially if we are so lucky to live alone, those who will be relying on wheelchair or whatever, the, a, any of the tools because of the age too. So, one, how are we doing, let's say, what, and intersection is the area where 
you know, pedestrians, they walk, get into the sidewalk. So what percentage can we say today are, have been designed or redesigned for people with disabilities? That's a good question, and I'm hoping someone will dig those numbers up. We have them here, but I don't have them off the top of my head. We'll have to get you those. I'm, I'm happy to say, you know, over the years, we have done a lot of work to install pedestrian ramps. I think one thing we've discovered in the course of our work with the advocates is that the city went through a burst of installing pedestrian ramps. I think we, we got up to installing sort of in the 90% area, but with a couple of caveats. We didn't have a good program in place to maintain them. And you know, this is, I think, one of the themes of my testimony in general. Installing is one thing, but continuing to maintain, particularly on our busy streets where things get drilled into and trucks drive over them. And then I think we had sort of this final component, which was particularly what we would call ped ramps in complex areas, where there is subway infrastructure underneath, or water and sewer infrastructure, catch basins that have to be moved. Those are the ones where admittedly the city has, I think, had a hard time keeping up. But again, now we're going to have a much more aggressive plan working with DDC to have some big co capital contracts to go in and get at that last group of sort of hard to reach ped ramps and then be upgrading all the ones that were previously installed that have been damaged or need to be improved to meet ADA standards. Okay, so I, look, I, I can say that one of the things that I had seen in my own neighborhood, and, and I, it, I will assume that that happened also throughout the five borough, is that sometime when the repaving happened, like some intersection, are not repay at the level where the water go through the drain at the intersection, but the water accumulates at the corner and then when the winter come, it turn ice and is an obstacle for people with disability. So I think that if it's with the in-house repaving that you do it, so to look, to pay attention, to really be sure that the repaving happen, intersection has to be also taking into, into consideration the accumulation of water when the rain will be sure that it go through the drain. That's one thing that I have seen. And I can tell you in my own community, Arden and Broadway is one of those. It's a little bit rain, the water is there, yes, in the intersection. They use in Broadway, the same thing. So I, it's more to have it in mind on, and, and I'm not into like, to call, you know, the OTA, hey, let's, let me know when something like that happened. But it's more, as you work with contractors or if you do in-house, to have it in mind, yep. the intersection was very important for people who are on. So of course, I would always say, if there is an intersection or a place in your district or elsewhere in the city you see where there's ponding or some other, of course, have your staff call and we'll go out and take a look. As we started to undertake this ambitious plan to make every ped ramp accessible, we ran into, I think, exactly the issue that you're talking about, Mr. Chairman, which is DOT is a piece of the puzzle, but there are so many other entities working on our streets. There are utilities, there are private contractors, there are our own city agencies, could be DEP, could be sanitation, DDC. And one of the things we realized is not only did we have to make sure that we ourselves were doing the right designs and, and meeting those challenging problems of sometimes where the street meet, meets the ped ramp, but we needed to educate and get all our other sister agencies on board. One challenge we have in New York, I, I've seen this happen in my own neighborhood. We install a ped ramp, it looks beautiful, Two days later, a heavy truck cuts the corner, drives over it, and it comes out of kilter. So again, one of the things in New York, the streets are kind of an organic entity. They are always changing. You know, we, we really do rely on you and your constituents to come to us when you see, and we, and we certainly, were, again, have a very robust system now where people can come and make complaints, but we really do rely on you. One day a ped ramp can be fine, the next day a truck ran over it, and we need to get out and make repairs. And last, one, I, I would like to, you know, I had to bring him back, what I said last time, and, and if, you know, this is something that for me is very, it's a tough situation for me because uh, being advocating citywide to increase the level of protected bike lane, and as you know, the speaker had taken the initiative to say we should aim to have 50, and we mentioned the 100, but at the end of the day, if we just get the 50, it will be a very important thing for the cyclist community. Uh, and as we, as we work in we expanding city bike, bike share, if by any chance a scooter will come to the city, 
we need, this is not a matter of luxury. We need to increase the number of protected bike lane in order to accommodate the space, especially for more cyclists and for those who will be using a scooter. So this only is yes, ESA to put you in, in your head. The last thing is about also, I need to get my protected bike lane in the north side of Dykeman. That was including the rezoning agreement. It's a language when we sign it with the premier. And I know it's not on you. It's, it's above you. But the mayor has refused to honor a piece of the agreement that is in the document signed by the deputy mayor, which is the only way that we have to connect cyclists in that green area from the west to the east. I, I will help, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. I will help. I want to thank you for being here today, and I look forward to uh, continued partnership and pushing even further. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker and Mr. Chairman. Thank you. So the next panel are the Families for Safe Streets, who are our heroes, who we love. Uh, I want to call up Iris Reyes, Devin Cipher, and Hindi Schachter. Are they here? No? Yes, okay. Iris Reyes, Devin Cipher, and Hindi Schachter. Okay, so you may uh, begin, just make sure the red light is on, uh, on the mic, if you push the button. And welcome, thank you for being here. Thank you. I shouldn't actually be here. I shouldn't be alive. Um, on July 3rd, 2015, I was run over by a double-decker tour bus while crossing 6th Avenue in Greenwich Village on a crosswalk, on a green light. I spent three months in the ICU, having multiple surgeries, and um, still couldn't fi leave me with a femoral vein or a peroneal nerve or a adrenal gland, which translates as meaning for the rest of my life, I will likely have pain, have, uh, have need of medication, wear a leg brace. And the thing about traffic violence is it doesn't discriminate doesn't matter race, religion, sexual orientation, class. Everyone in this room is at risk the moment you leave the building. And, um, and the proposed bill, uh, 1557, could possibly reduce that risk. And if some of those proposed changes had been in effect in 2015, my crash and many others could likely have been avoided. Um, for example, the bike lanes, if they had been on 6th Avenue, would have created less lanes of traffic for the bus driver to requiring his attention. Um, and lanes would likely trigger him to be on the outlook for bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, it's, um, I'm here to support the bill, but also to urge consideration of additional safety measures and amendments. Um, daylighting has been brought up. The removal of visual barriers um, would greatly have reduced the chance of my crash taking place, for eliminating my injuries and eliminating many deaths. Having no parking by crosswalks, around the crosswalks, allowing, would allow for more visual, um, uh, uh, would increase the visibility for drivers to see the pedestrians, especially children and people in wheelchairs, and it would also allow pedestrians to make eye contact with drivers. I um, recently returned from Spain, and I was so impressed with many of the cities there, the priority they gave to pedestrians. Pedestrian signals counted down to green lights as well as red lights. Pedestrian, there were pedestrian-only intervals for crossing intersections. Um, um, Mr. Chairman, you re referred to the power of public service announcements. There were giant billboards, government-sponsored, about driving safely. And I felt safer there, not because of any specific in individual enhancement, but the overall effect conveyed that there was a concern for the well-being for me and all pedestrians. And I think that message, yeah, literal and, um, and um, subliminal, 
communicates the um, importance um, and can, it makes drivers um, more likely to be concerned about safety. Um, I am very lucky to be here, lucky to be alive, lucky to live in one of the greatest cities on the planet. And this city is such a beacon that any life-changing ch changing measures can ch save lives around the world. You have that power. I thank you for utilizing that power and wielding so wisely. And thank you for your dedication to this issue. I'm Hindi Schachter. I'm a, a senior citizen cyclist, pedestrian, and driver. In all of those roles, I would support a master plan to reclaim this city from car dominance and in the speaker's immemorial words, to make it a people-focused infrastructure city. I started to cycle the streets of, New of Manhattan in the 1970s, long before bike lanes. As my husband and I rode down, say, Second Avenue, people would scream, get out of the street. You belong on the sidewalk. Since my husband could easily ride over 20 miles an hour on the flats for long times, it wasn't our lack of speed. It was simply they didn't want to share the space. My husband isn't here to testify today because on August 3rd, 2014, he was practicing for the marathon, running in the pedestrian-only lane in Central Park, when a 17-year-old cyclist veered into the lane at speed, collided with him, his life was over. Who do we blame for that? Well, we blame the cyclist. But we also blame the design in Central Park, one barely legible line between the cycling lane and the pedestrian lane. That's why, ever since his passing, I have dedicated to his memory a fight for safe street design. You gave us a bill with Vision Zero design standard, you passed it. Thank you. Now you have in front of you a bill for a master plan with benchmarks and goals, and you need that, because everything I've heard in the testimony for the last hour and a half is we're doing wonderful things, but there are so many constraints your master plan will make sure that even if there are constraints, the agencies move in the direction of a people-centered city. My husband isn't here to testify today, but today I cycle the streets of Manhattan with my granddaughter, and I ask you in our name to pass this master plan and to give us a city where for many years we can cycle safely together. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Schechter, I, you've testified at the council before and your testimony is always moving and painful to hear about um, the tragic and uh, preventable loss uh, of your husband, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you have had to live with that pain for nearly the last five years, uh, but I am, of course, so grateful to Families for Safe Streets and people like you who continue in the aftermath of such a painful, tragic, life-altering incident to use your voice to advocate so that this doesn't have to happen to other families and other wives and other grandfathers and husbands 
Uh, and so I really just want to thank you for not just being here today, but your real continued advocacy and showing up and in speaking uh, from what you've had to endure and go through. So I want to thank you, and I want to thank you, Devin, for uh, being here. I think I remember that incident that happened on 6th Avenue uh, in my district uh, with that double-decker tourist bus. And I, of course, you and I have not met before, I don't believe, but um, thank God that you're here today. And I'm sorry that you're still living with the consequences uh, and effects from that uh, traffic violence that you had to endure. And again, I'm really grateful that you're using your voice and advocacy to ensure that other people don't have to go through uh, being in the ICU for three months and not knowing if they were going to live or have full mobility again or be able to be a full citizen. And so, again, for both of you, I just want to say I am tremendously grateful and moved by your testimony, by your showing up, by your leadership, and uh, by your advocacy. And I'm just incredibly grateful um, that you're here today and that you continue to do that work. So thank you both very, very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I want to call up the next panel, uh, Christine Berte from CheckPeds, Adriana Espinoza from NYLCV, Kate Slevin from the Regional Plan Association, John Orkett from Bike New York, and uh, Eric McClure from Streets Pack. Oh, there we go. Oh, happened to you. Yeah, it's not driving. Oh, okay. yeah. Make sure that John is okay and getting to his. Yeah. Yes. Oh, thanks. He's okay. Sit in the chair. Thank you, John, uh, for being here on crutches. Um, and I want to start with Christine Berte. Right. Good morning, Speaker Johnson, and good morning, uh, Chair Rodriguez and his team council members. I am Christine Berthe, the co-founder of CheckPeds, a 15-year-old advocacy coalition for pedestrian safety. We applaud the creation of a five-year transportation plan for New York City, but we want walking to be a priority in this master plan. Everyone walks in New York, 11.4 million of us walk every day, you know, from parking lots to stores, uh, to and from bus and subway stops, to home or work. Uh, the 1.1 million of commuters which arrive at bus terminal and Grand Central and Penn Station walk. 60 million tourists visit New York annually, they walk. And we pay the highest price for it. Since 2014, 663 crash fatalities involve pedestrians, which is 50% of the total crash fatalities. And 55,000 pedestrians were injured in our fair city. So please remember that. And yet in Manhattan, and Chair Rodriguez, you said that earlier, our walking infrastructure has been overlooked. Sidewalks are crowded to the point of overflowing into traffic at great risk to walkers. There are at least five different laws for the minimum width of the pedestrian right of way in, uh, in the, the rules of the city, all the way from 9.6 to three feet. And while it takes two days to fill the potholes, it takes six months to repair dangerous sidewalk conditions. People with disabilities have to sue the city to obtain compliance with federal laws. So it is time to re-envision our sidewalks, our walk lanes, and to address the pressing needs of their users, all of us, in this master plan. CheckPeds recommends that the annual uh, citywide audit be performed for 500 miles of walk lanes out of a network of 12,000 miles the audit must address the capacity of the walk lane compared to the volume, the level of protection provided on sidewalk and crosswalks, and the quality of pavement, and it would address also ADA rules. To support Vision Zero, it should prioritize transportation hubs and high crash areas. 
DOT should then perform upgrades to create protected walk lanes, remove obstacles, widen the sidewalks, protect walkers from vehicles, and raise sidewalks and islands, split phase, LPI, stronger lighting, etc., and repair the pavement. 200 miles should be upgraded each year. DOT should establish standards for a minimum walk lane, and after all, um, DOT must consider institutional changes for the sound maintenance and enforcement of the walk lanes. And as far as accountability, we should publish an annual report of completed projects and changes implemented and project planned for the following year. Thank you. Thank you, as always, for everything, Christine. You're the best. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Adriana Espinosa. I'm the director of the New York City program at the New York League of Conservation Voters. I wanted to thank uh, Speaker Johnson, Chair Rodriguez, for the opportunity to testify in support of Intro 1557. Um, one of NYLCV's top priorities is ensuring that New Yorkers have access to sustainable, low-carbon modes of transportation. And we believe that mass transit, pedestrian safety, and smart, excuse me, smart street design are crucial to achieving this goal. With a comprehensive citywide vision, New Yorkers can more easily pursue sustainable modes of transportation, reduce dependency on vehicles, uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and breathe cleaner air as a result. That's why we strongly support Intro 1557. And we thank Speaker Johnson for advancing this forward-looking proposal. We are grateful for the ambitious goals required in the plans, particularly those for bus, bus lanes, bike lanes, and transit signal priority. We have long pushed for increased deployment of this critical infrastructure, and in fact, we are pursuing a transportation master plan uh, legislation at the state level, which has recently passed both houses up in Albany. Uh, a comprehensive approach to the design and expansion of these spaces represents an incredible opportunity not only to reduce congestion and improve mobility in the city, but also sustainability and well-being for all New Yorkers. Our most recent policy agenda called for a comprehensive growth, growth strategy that incorporates affordable, reliable mass transit and walkable neighborhoods that connect people to jobs and education to address threats to livable, sustainable communities. And we're thankful uh, that the City Council, under the leadership of Speaker Johnson, has recognized and acted on this need. Uh, additionally, we believe that transparency and accountability are, are critical in the policymaking process and commend the bill sponsor for including provisions related to public engagement and tracking of ben uh, benchmarks and implementation. And we respectfully request the inclusion of the following to, uh, to consider strengthening the bill. Uh, incentives for ze zero emission vehicles, including green loading zones, promoting the proliferation of green infrastructure, such as street trees bios and bioswales, which would help enhance the city's air and water quality, maximize the use of sustainable materials, and require interagency coordination. The city of New York has never undertaken a transit plan of this scale, and thus should, be, should take its time to be deliberate, exhaustive, and inclusive with the planning process. Um, October 1st of 2019 is coming up, and so we um, would think that should be uh, maybe revisited so that this um, pr planning process can be more thorough. And uh, to conclude, I'd like to thank Speaker Johnson and the Committee on Transportation for your ongoing support of transit issues that concern our members, and I look forward to working with you both. Thanks. Thank you, Adriana. Kate? Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Kate Slevin, a Senior Vice President at Regional Plan Association. We are here today to strongly support Intro 1557, which would create a master plan for city streets once every five years. And we thank you both for your leadership in moving this bill forward. In RPA's fourth regional plan, a we, that looks out for a blueprint for the next 30 years, we laid out a vision for city streets that is very consistent with what is in this legislation. In our research, we found that currently less than a quarter of New York City street space is dedicated to sustainable modes, including walking, cycling, and exclusive bus lanes. And most of this is concentrated in Manhattan and the very dense parts of the city. Looking forward, we called for street design and management practices to be turned upside down to prioritize pedestrians, cyclists, and transit users first, followed by goods movement, shared services, and finally, the private automobile. This would allow up to 80% of street space to be used for sustainable modes eventually, as illustrated by the images in your testimony. We appreciate this legislation's focus on protected bicycle and bus lanes. Existing painted bike lanes without physical separation are often blocked by cars and can lead to unsafe conditions, and they're certainly not safe for young children. 
Our research has also found that commute times has grown, especially for the outer boroughs, um, and for commutes over 60 minutes. And a big contributing factor to this is slow bus speeds. And so by prioritizing buses on city streets, we'll be able to speed up bus speeds and speed up commutes for New Yorkers. Intro 1557, um, might lead to trade-offs in terms of depth of community outreach, but after years of implementing bicycle lanes, bus lanes, plazas, I think communities are more familiar with these approaches and DOT more experienced at implementing them. We are comfortable with shortening the community outreach process to meet these goals should they need to occur. RPA supports the expansion of public plazas, and we know that the current plaza management approach, which requires local bids to take on financial and legal risks of public space management, limits the broad expansion of the program. One option to address this is to have a citywide government entity to manage the plazas, as has been proposed by some of our colleagues. And finally, a few questions to consider as the bill negotiations continue. How is the City Council and DUT going to work together to meet the benchmarks in the legislation, and is there an enforcement mechanism? And what are the role of the City Council members in implementation? It would be ill-advised to pass this legislation and then have council members within their own districts trying to delay individual projects. RPA is here as a resource as you consider this moving forward and work to improve transportation more broadly throughout the city. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Kate. John, Thank you, uh, speaker. make sure your mic is on. Let's go. Thank you, Speaker and Chair. Um, Bike New York strongly supports um, both bills before you, the uh, street master plan measure and the one allowing bike riders to proceed uh, at leading pedestrian interval traffic signals. Um, both, if enacted, would mark uh, major milestones on the path to a bike-friendly New York. Um, what we're really excited about in the street master plan idea is, is a new process for implementing bike lanes in the city. Um, we think the city can conduct public outreach and be very extensive and thorough in that without granting a veto over projects to community boards. It's a really good precedent for the approach. Um, DOT planning for the system of city bike stations solicits a huge amount of input from community boards, other local groups and institutions, but it never seeks an up or down vote on where the stations go. There's a lot of adjustment, there's a lot of dialogue, but the city ultimately acts and implements the system. And we can't build a transportation system like City Bike or a network of protected bike lanes if some parts of the city are allowed to opt out. Um, city Bike would not be one of the leading bike share systems in the world today if the city had followed the community board process that it now uses for bike lanes. Um, <clears throat> so just to sum up, other things that are fantastic in the master plan. Um, strong definition of protected bike lanes. Define the bike network as consisting of protected bike lanes. Call for protected bike lanes in every square mile of the city. Emphasize bike network connectivity, including the requirement that this be measured, which the city used to do but abandoned in 2014. Um, and establish a city goal of 50 miles of protected bike lanes implemented each year. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Chair, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. I am Eric McClure. I'm the Executive Director of Streets PAC. We strongly support Intro 1557, which would require the Department of Transportation to issue and implement a master plan for use of the city's streets, sidewalks, and pedestrian spaces. Mr. Speaker, as uh, you underscored in the comprehensive Let's Go report that your office issued in March, the city too often takes the path of least resistance in implementing bicycle or pedestrian or transit projects. This is not meant as a criticism of NYC DOT. Commissioner Trottenberg and her teams are deeply committed to the safety and mobility of all New Yorkers. Politics, however, too often get in the way of their work. While the department is, of course, concerned about being held to arbitrary targets, we're confident that NYC, DOT, and the council can arrive at mutually agreed benchmarks that are both aggressive and achievable. And the simple fact is that we need targets. The city's bicycle master plan has not been updated since it was issued in 1997. While we have, of course, expanded greatly on that plan, we are still far from the kind of fully connected and safe bike network the speaker's report envisions and that a truly bike-friendly city requires. Creating a master plan will also help insulate our progress on transportation from the vagaries of changing administrations. We're falling behind major world cities that have more quickly recognized the importance of reducing car dependency, including Paris, London, Oslo, and Barcelona, to name just a few. The future of New York City surely is not one in which cars will dominate our streets, and a master plan will help us get to that future more quickly, directly, and efficiently. A master plan will also help us better integrate the many facets of our transportation network. 
There's no good reason that New Yorkers shouldn't be able to transfer freely from a bus to a ferry or a shared bicycle to a subway. And the fact that our transit system is not fully accessible to all New Yorkers, regardless of their mobility, is just not acceptable. Additionally, a comprehensive plan will be critical to turning around our struggling bus system, which is in dire need of separated lanes, universal signal priority, streamlined routing, and all-door boarding. It will help us more quickly rationalize the way we treat the curbside, implement better parking and loading zone policies, and accelerate the breaking of car culture. It will improve the safety and mobility of all New Yorkers. It is hugely important, however, that the City Council provide NYC DOT with the resources it will need to create and adhere to a transportation master plan. This is a mandate that cannot go unfunded. As the first line of the Let's Go report states, transportation is the lifeblood of New York. We must ensure that we fund it as such. Lastly, Streets Pack fully and unequivocally supports intro 1457, which would permit a person riding a bicycle to proceed on a green leading pedestrian, pedestrian interval or LPI signal at an intersection. The 50 intersection pilot program for the LPI for Bikes effort has been a complete success and we urge quick passage and implementation of the bill. It will improve safety for people riding bikes without compromising safety for anyone else. Let's roll it out citywide as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks for being here, appreciate it. Thanks for your testimony. Next up, Jim Weitzman uh, from the United Spinal Association, Janet Lift from Open Plans, uh, Terry Carta from Brooklyn Greenway Initiative, Raymond Wayne from the National Federation of the Blind, and Karen Gorgi from Pedestrians for Accessible and Safe Streets. Did Karen leave? She had to leave? Okay. Okay. So when, when is your thing going to Thank you. I don't know. Uh, Kathleen Treat can come up and testify in her place. Go ahead. Okay. Do you need help, sir? So why don't we start with uh, with Raymond, um, who I really want to uh, take your time. I want to, uh, Kathleen, if you could just make sure the mic is uh, on, and I want to thank him for his patience and being here today. And if you could apologize to Karen for us not getting to her in time. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and um, good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Mr. Chair, for giving us the opportunity to uh, testify today. Um, I am Ray Wayne. I represent the National Federation of the Blind New York City Chapter, uh, NFB for short. We are an organization of blind people speaking for ourselves. I, we are, as an organization, also a member of the Pedestrians for Accessible and Safe Streets, that's PASS Coalition, which is a member, which is a organization of about 20 or more organi organizations in the blindness field. Um, we, and again, my colleague and friend, Dr. Gorgi was not able to stay, but I've handed in her testimony as well as NFB's. Um, we, and I want, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, you stole, you took, you took some of my thunder and I'm glad that you did. <laughs> because you, you hit on the problem that we as blind people who walk the streets of New York City face, and nobody, nobody, nobody intended to do this to us. I know that LPIs and EPPs have a useful purpose and we are in favor of them. However, APSs, need to keep up with, LP, with LPIs and EPPs. Uh, the commissioner said a while ago there are about 13,000 intersections with traffic signals in New York City. As of April 26th of this year, 418 of those had APSs. 
that's like, I, I forgot to do the math, but that's like less than 1%. Um, in 2018, DOT installed 485 LPIs, but only 85 a APSs, that's a 10 to one ratio. The, before I came here today, I was my understanding that DOT is planning to is, uh, install 150 APSs per year. At that rate, with my math, it would take more than 75 years to complete the installation of APSs. And with, with LPIs, and I, I, in my testimony, I go into the techniques that blind people use to cross streets, but with LPIs, we lose that parallel trap, that auditory cue that I've been relying on like for like 50 years, literally, of because during the, during the pedestrian phase, there's no traffic moving. So if I'm, cro if I'm crossing, say, Fourth Avenue, I'm listening for the traffic on Ovington Avenue, which is the parallel street, to start to move, and I'm not hearing it, because guess what? There's an LPI, and other pedestrians who see the, who, who see the walk signal in their favor across, are crossing the street, but the cars aren't moving. So I don't have that auditory queue. And by the way, it's generally not a good idea to follow other pedestrians, because they do all kinds of crazy things, like cross against the light. And, and you know, cross while they're texting and so on and so forth. So I generally don't do that. Um, we need to, again, DOT, we, what we are asking is that the 2019 master plan include a um, program, a plan for completing the installation, did I lose the mic, of AP, of, APS is, um, the commissioner said, some, I believe she said they were gonna triple the number. That would be great, but even, even at that rate, it's gonna take 25 years. I, I won't be around to see it. Um, also, the Mr. bill Mr. talks, I'm sorry? Mr. Wayne, if you could just wrap up. Yeah, just two quick things. The bill talks about, um, real-time bus, real bus information, and, and that's fine, but it also needs to be in an auditory and large print uh, accessible format, and pedestrian plazas need to be designed in such a way that they are easily, that the, the borders of it are easily uh, detectable for uh, blind people, and that's, all that is in PASS's testimony and uh, our respective contact information is in both of our testimonies. And thank you again for your support. No, thank you for being here. I really appreciate your leadership and your testimony and your patience. So thank you so much for being here today. Uh, Kathleen. Hi. Thank you both. Thank all of you for your hard work on behalf of New Yorkers, all of us, disabled and otherwise. I am Kathleen Treat. I am a proud member of Check Peds. I'm here to speak on behalf of my husband, Martin, who is a disabled veteran. We live on the west side. He gets all around the city in a fabulous electric scooter provided by the wonderful VA. And we completely depend on buses to get us all over the city. I know every route of every Manhattan bus by heart. There's a couple of things I'd like to informally say about the bus system here. One is eternal gratitude for whoever designed the kneeling bus. I think all our, all our city buses are kneeling buses and they're marvelous, as are bus drivers. I've never met, in the 10 years since Martin's diagnosis, I've never met a bus driver who wasn't kind and courteous and professional in every way. We need more buses. 
It's great to hear Polly Trottenberg talk about studies and surveys and yada, 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 and bells and whistles, and God knows what they're spending on all that stuff, but we need more buses. We also need, I think, more help from the NYPD. We need guys on the ground giving out tickets to drivers who are clogging up the bus lanes. I'm sorry that the DOT people aren't here anymore, but aren't here today, but they talk about bus lane planning and studies and surveys, da 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 da. On the ground, they need to take a disabled New Yorker with them on those studies. Martin would be happy to demonstrate what's needed. Thank you. We love Martin Treat, so thanks for being here to represent your wonderful husband. Uh, Jim? Uh, thank you, Speaker Johnson, Chairman Rodriguez, uh, for your support of us in the past and for this great city planning initiative. Very few, uh, I'm going to read my testimony, but I should say that very few disability specific projects were the result of city planning. They're always the result of advocacy by disabled people who end up in court and get a consent decree requiring the city to do something. Mm -hmm. And so it happens in fits and starts, and it's not comprehensive, and nobody ever gets 10,000 feet above the city and figures out how people with disabilities get anywhere, and this is a very healthy way to proceed. Um, I represent, and my name is Jim Weissman. I'm a disability rights lawyer for 42 years and for the last three or four, for the last 40 years I've been at Eastern Paralyzed Veterans Association, now called the United Spinal Association, and for the last three or four I've been CEO and executive director too. Um, we have 53,000 members nationally who've suffered spinal cord injuries or diseases, and uh, since our founding in 1946 by Paralyzed Veterans, our goal was to integrate people who use wheelchairs into the American mainstream. We're the guys, and I'm the lawyer that sued New York City in 79 and the MTA to make buses and subways accessible. I was very young then, and I would be scared to do that now, but I didn't know better then. And uh, uh, we settled in 84, and all we could get were key stations, because even the most right-thinking liberal Democrats thought this was a crazy idea. There was only one city council person who supported us in the entire course of the litigation. Um, and it was all Democrats at the time. So, you know, this is an idea that's been coming of age, accessibility, and it's a pleasure to hear it as part of the city's plan now to move forward. Um, mobility is the key to the economic success of, I want to talk about curb ramps, because, and because as of July 23rd, there'll be a hearing and when I'll, I'll submit my written testimony because we don't have time to read. As of July 23rd, this settlement agreement with the city DOT for a comprehensive plan for curb ramps that will cost about a billion or more over the life of the agreement, which is going to be 30 years um, to implement. As of July 23rd, there'll be a fairness hearing in federal district court on it, and it will become, assuming it's approved, uh, it's been preliminarily approved by the court, it will become the law. So whatever plan we do pursuant to the uh, legislation that's proposed, we'll have to incorporate that. But I want to tell you to relax, because it's good. It really is good. It's going to be comprehensive. There's going to be, and, and Commissioner Trottenberg talked about it, and my testimony lays it out, and I can give you, there's a link to the settlement agreement, because it's like 65 pages. But in my testimony, there's a link to it, or this, the website is there so you can pull it up and review it. But you're going to have upgrades on existing broken curb ramps and curb ramps that for your husband are probably unusable. Um, Commissioner Trottenberg is right. Trucks turn corners and break them right after they're installed. Even, and of course there's no steel rim on the corner when there's a curb ramp, so it's vulnerable. Um, many, many of them have to be upgraded for visually impaired people because when we originally sued New York City in 94 to get curb ramps, Giuliani made us litigate the entire, his entire administration. He would not settle. And Mayor Bloomberg settled it his first two months in office. 
um, when they did not put truncated domes on many of them, the bubbles, the tactile underfoot warnings for low vision people. And so the city DOT has to go back and do that. They were not required by the federal government then. There was just, they put lines across them. You've seen the old ones. Um, to, tr to try to make it textured, but this way it will be uniform and predictable and people with visual disabilities will be able to rely on it. They'll also all meet, their, and there's a tremendous amount of work being done to regrade sidewalks so that they meet slope and transverse slope, cross slope requirements as well of the Americans with Disabilities Act, so they will be safe. There'll be an, up an ongoing maintenance program. Thanks, Jim. 400 people have been added to the staff. Thank you, Jim. To do this. So please incorporate our settlement agreement into your plan, and thanks for the opportunity to be heard. Thank you, really Jim. Really appreciate it. Thanks for everything. Janet. Hi, um, uh, Chairman and, and Speaker. Thank you for, for having and being able to speak. My name is Janet Liff. I'm co-director of the Neighborhood Empowerment Project at Open Plans. Our mission is, in, is to empower local stakeholders to take ownership of and solve their problems on the local level. As part of this process, we've been talking with block associations, nonprofits, bids, community boards across the city. In 201, we keep hearing the same stories. West 50's Neighborhood Association can't clean up the filth on 56th Street, get bike racks for the delivery people. Sixth Avenue is a speedway. Fourth on Fourth and Park Slope has the same issues, clamoring for green infrastructure to combat their heat on the sidewalk. Therefore, we support local law 1557 to measure our streets and sidewalks with the following two recommendations. One, metrics are very important, but which ones and how are they collected? We need to think critically and identify the desired outcome and determine which data will reflect that. X miles of bus lanes and bike lanes each year sounds nice, but what does it mean? If safety is what we're after, rather you should ask, what percentage of pedestrian and cyclists feel safe? How much do we want to move the needle? If it's 15% now, do we try to double that each year? And even if our KSI is down, if people still are afraid to bike, the design is wrong. When 80% of the people say they feel safe on our streets, then we will have won. So I, I emphasize that strongly. Also, the bill, um, when dealing with streets and sidewalks, obviously both priority has to be people first. The bill acknowledges that. We commend that. We just ask that you establish a level of service for pedestrians, again, which to measure our streets. In addition to safety, the quality of experience is crucial. When is the sidewalk too crowded? Are people forced, forced off the curb? Is there padlock? Is it too hot? We have to add qualitative questions and look to address those. Thank you very much on my testimony. I included two links to two studies that discuss these and I think would uh, enrich, the, um, enrich the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Terry Carta and I represent Bro Brooklyn Greenway Initiative. BGI is a private nonprofit organization that has been focused for nearly two decades on the development, establishment, and long-term stewardship of the Brooklyn Waterfront Greenway, which is a 26-mile protected and landscaped route for pedestrians and cyclists of all ages and abilities that encircles the borough of Brooklyn and connects with Queens on both sides. The Greenway adds new mobility options for transit-starved residential and business communities and connects workers to new and growing job centers along the waterfront and to the Manhattan and Queens Greenway networks. BGI enthusiastically supports the proposed bill and the vision it puts forth for our city, particularly around the safety, mobility, and quality of life improvements it will deliver. BGI is especially excited about the bill's focus on building a complete network and its requirements to measure and report the network connectivity index on an annual basis and as the master plan is updated in five-year intervals. Our experience with the Greenway is that as segments are implemented, they become immediately popular and are used by commuters, recreational runners and cyclists, families, and even local businesses delivering goods to market in small cargo bikes. We've even seen adaptive cycles, um, adaptive bicycles on the Greenway as well. Perhaps the best example of this is the Greenway segment along Kent Avenue in Williamsburg. In 2012, DOT took a bold step to reconfigure Kent Avenue to allow for a bi-directional protected bike lane and separate pedestrian route. 
Now it's one of the most heavily used commuter routes in all of New York City. And on the weekend, it's packed with other types of commuters, if you will. People, local residents and others visiting waterfront parks, the shopping corridor, and local restaurant scene. This success story has been repeated for the Greenway segments from Brooklyn Bridge Park through Red Hook, along the Shore Parkway Greenway, among others, demonstrating the incredible public demand and the immediate benefits afforded by the Greenway. However, it can't fulfill its full potential until remaining gaps are filled and the route is fully connected. So BGI also applauds the proposed bill's focus on accountability to bold targets and supports all efforts that enable DOT to take a more strategic and proactive approach to implementation of the Greenway and other protected facilities for pedestrians and cyclists. We strongly believe that the connectivity index is the way to ensure that targets are met in the most impactful way. And frankly, the previous approach toward implementation quote, as funds and opportunities arise, simply isn't sufficient. Implementation funds need to be fully allocated, not found. Coordinating support for the bold targets outlined in this bill among city agencies and within our communities is the only way that we can reach these goals. Closing major gaps in the Greenway, which exist in Red Hook, Sunset Park, Coney Island, and Dumbo, should be addressed within the scope of the first master plan to be issued on October 1st, 2019 which would deliver a completed greenway by October 2024. It can be done within five years when we're all aligned on goals and targets and would immediately benefit Brooklyn's 2.65 million residents, over 1.1 million employees, and 15 million visitors from across the city and around the world. BGI looks forward to continuing to work with the city and other stakeholders to move the Brooklyn Waterfront Greenway to completion as a critical trunk route in the overall ne network that has been described today. A leading factor to growth in greenway use is perceived and real safety um, benefits that such a protected route offers. Prioritizing completion of the greenway will move us more swiftly toward vision zero standards as greater numbers of people using all mobility options live and work along the waterfront. Thank you for bringing this conversation to the, to the fore with council members, um, and thank you, Chair Rodriguez and the Transportation Committee for the opportunity to testify before you today. Thank you. So now we have a council member. who also will speak about the bill that we have. Thank you, Chair uh, Rodriguez, and hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here today um, as a member of this amazing committee on transportation, but also as lead sponsor for uh, intro 1457. What I want to say here is how important it is that we keep patients alive uh, when designing b bills. Uh, this one came a few years back uh, when I first introduced it back in 2016. Um, this is now the opportunity that we have in this new session to really take a step forward in making New York City our great city here in New York, uh, America's safest city for cyclists. Because we are not there yet. We're not there yet at allowing for our infrastructure to really match our commitment. And cyclists are being killed on our streets every day. Uh, not every day, but they're being killed uh, on a yearly basis. And eight New Yorkers so far this year and that is more than one a month, and two cyclists in my district alone. And while every bike lane is great, amazing progress, they don't help where cyclists are more at risk. Intersections are the most dangerous place for people on bikes, and they are busy and stressful and complicated. Cyclists die when drivers don't see them. I find myself in that situation many times when I'm riding to City Hall, where I'm at an interstate section and I can't make eye contact with the truck where I am. Getting those extra seconds to cross, allowing us all as cyclists to use the LPI, the leading pedestrian interval at these intersections that give pedestrians that extra set of seconds to cross will change that for bicyclists. By allowing cyclists to get ahead of traffic, people on bikes are more visible to drivers and therefore more safe. Proud to sponsor this bill and proud that this came as an idea from the community. This came directly from uh, our, our big powerful bike lobby um, and, and it became, it became a, a legislative project. And we went to the NYPD, we went to the Department of Transportation 
and all they came back with was, well, we can't do it because it's a new project and there's a lot of all these issues and we don't know if it's actually safe. It's gonna make everything really unsafe. It's really complicated. And we finally said, okay, fine, let's do, let's do a study. Let's let the data show us the way through. And that's why it's taken so long. And the data came back and it's been incredible to be working with a speaker and our transportation chair, DOT and NYPD, so that we can take advantage of this awesome and which will dramatically create safety uh, as an improvement for cyclists at intersections. This is smart government. This is smart government and it's essentially free. That's the kind of stuff that this city council is doing and I'm really excited to be supporting the speaker's uh, package of uh, changes as well for a five-year plan. And I'm thankful and uh, I don't know if there's anybody else that's testifying, but thank you so much, Chair. recognize that we also had before Councilmember Levine and Miller and, and Reynoso. Greg Mahalovich, Eamon Romani, Patrick Condren, Stan Litvick, Glenn Every. Whoever wants to begin. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Rodriguez and Councilman Chaka. My name is Glenn Avery, and I am the president of a newly formed trade organization, Bus for NYC. I'm also the owner and operator of a company that has provided bus service in New York State for more than 50 years. Bus for NYC is a New York City-based advocacy group comprised of private bus company owners and related businesses and associations promoting the industry as a viable transportation solution and a local economic driver. Our members include commuter, tour, charter, and sightseeing bus companies, uh, including National Express, Adirondack Trailways, Big Bus, Academy, West Point Tours, TTI, and Hampton Jitney, among others. Our members' operations range from interstate travel throughout the United States right down to the local New York City streets. We applaud the City Council for ensuring that the New York City DOT look at traffic planning through a comprehensive approach with an eye towards safety and congestion reduction. We as Bus for NYC members share the City Council's goal of reducing congestion and greenhouse gas emissions while encouraging residents and visitors to consider public transportation. We are private providers of public transportation and an important piece of the traffic mobility puzzle. As such, we are not the problem. We are an integral part of the solution. Each bus that we operate takes as many as 55 single occupancy cars off the road while bringing commuters to work, shoppers to small businesses, and visitors to vibrant destinations, all of which are a critical part of the fabric of New York City. Uh, regarding the bill's language that is specific to our industry, uh, that is the 150 miles of protected bus lanes, we support this approach. With the proliferation of four hire vehicles and the explosion of e-commerce, congestion in New York City is at an all-time high. 
Many of our drivers, especially those that are bringing commuters and visitors into and out of the city, are finding it increasingly difficult to comply with hours of service mandates set forth by the federal DOT uh, because of the relatively recent spike in congestion that puts them at a standstill and because of the diminishing amount of areas for bus parking and layovers. Finally, one consideration that we as bus operators would like to raise regarding protected bus lanes is that DOT should ensure that barriers surrounding protected lanes are realistically positioned to accommodate the turning radius of 45 foot long vehicles. And we would also ask that any planning take into account suitable bus parking and layover space. We will be sure to work closely with DOT on these operational details. In conclusion, uh, Bus for NYC is supportive of Intro 1557 and looks forward to working with the City Council and DOT on a continuing basis. While this bill's timeline is aggressive, we applaud the Speaker and the Council's consideration of protected bus lanes and improved bus infrastructure. Not only will these measures reduce congestion, but they will also increase economic output, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and help to ensure that improved safety and Vision Zero goals are met. Thank you very much for your consideration. So, thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Rodriguez and Council Member Kamanchaka and others in the room. Thank you. Um, my name is Patrick Condren. I've uh, addressed the Council and committees and the Board of Estimate for many, many years. I'm pleased to also be a Transportation Alternatives member for many, many years. Notwithstanding that, I uh, since the 1960s, have been actively engaged with the bus operations here in New York City, starting at West 43rd Street, near the then relatively new identified Port Authority bus terminal. Prior to the formation of the MTA, the majority of buses in New York City were private, privately operated, privately run. My operations included charter and tour operations, as well as shuttle bus contracts, plus a franchise bus commuter company here in New York City. I was one of the private carriers and public transportation of the five boroughs. It is noteworthy to note that the traffic grid is fundamentally the same all these years. I applaud the initiative to create a master plan at this time to increase bike lanes on intro 1457 uh, and the master plan for 14, uh, 1557. I should point out that the effort the Bus for NYC Coalition is starting is a working group that provides the private and public sector to maintain and continue a dialogue and be transformative at this time. In the last hundred years, things haven't changed. A critical element of this plan should include input of the private carriers who provide the public with public transport. The individual vehicles of charter tour, intercity, sightseeing, commuter, airport, shuttle bus, and related bus operations often have a fleet that counts in total fleet buses in excess or just close to the 5,000 vehicles being operated by the MTA. Those buses include those various categories of efficiently moving people around town. Private buses maintain a very high safety orientation with some companies filing plans to the New York State Public Transportation Safety Board. A lot of people in New York City don't realize that. Additionally, companies like Academy Bus sponsor Vision Zero and Transportation Alternatives Vision Zero conferences. They participate in them. The Bus Industry Safety Council. They also submit data to the National Transit Database, which benefits all New Yorkers by increasing the pie for the state of New York, which the city of New York shares under its unusual circumstance of having the New York State operated system. I am pleased to work with Hampton Jitney, with Academy Bus, with Big Bus Tours, right here in New York City and others I'm a member, a board member of the Bus Association of New York, the American Bus Association, and others. We support the new initiative of Bus for NYC you just heard about, and you will hear more about it. And we suggest again to be a participant in the master planning processes for utilizing the most efficient per passenger vehicle for passenger transportation mobility, which is a bus. I should note that C Commissioner Trottenberg referred to the a street equity graph before where a bus is the most efficient vehicle. Cars take up the big space, buses take up that much space for 100 people. Once again, I applaud your efforts. Please rest assured of our support and, and continuing uh, cooperation, and uh, thank you again. 
Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair Rodriguez, Councilmember Menchaca. My name is Greg Mihailovich. I am uh, the Community Advocacy Director for the American Heart Association here in New York City. And <clears throat> Excuse me, and we're testifying in favor of intro 1557. So the American Heart Association is the na nation's largest and oldest voluntary organization dedicated to fighting heart disease and stroke, of which approximately 80% of diagnoses are preventable. So accordingly, AHA prioritizes increasing physical activity and physical fitness across the population because engaging in daily physical activity reduces the risk of obesity, coronary heart disease, stroke, hypertension, diabetes, and even some types of cancer. Promoting active transportation, the opportunity to bike, walk, roll to work, school, and around the community and do so safely through policy systems and environmental change is one of the leading evidence-based strategies to increase physical activity across the lifespan. Okay, so vulnerable populations, including people of lower income, people of color, the elderly, children, people with disabilities, are often disproportionately affected by incomplete and unsafe streets. And pedestrian fatality rates are often higher in these communities, and many also suffer from higher rates of obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. And the AHA recommends at least 30 minutes of moderate intensity uh, aerobic activity at least five days a week for overall cardiovascular health. And providing safe active transportation options for these underserved communities provides an opportunity for that daily physical activity and results in better health outcomes for all New Yorkers. So complete streets are obviously a, a safety issue and a transportation issue and an environmental issue. And I'd like this opportunity to remind the council that it's also a health equity issue. You give the opportunity here. So uh, the, a, the AHA uh, thanks Speaker Johnson, Chair Rodriguez, and all the sponsors of Intro 5057 for their leadership. And we look forward to the passage and impl implementation of the bill. Thank you. Hi, my name is Iman Ramawi. I'm from the New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, and I am their accessoride coordinator and organizer. Um, NILPI's Disability Justice Program works to advance civil rights and ensure equality of, and opportunity, self-determination, and the independence of New Yorkers with disabilities. NILPI disability advocates have represented thousands of individuals and won campaigns improving the lives of hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers. We have long fought for equality to access the public transportation for persons with disabilities, and we are members of the Accessoride Reform Group, or ARG, um, which, you know, makes us uh, feel that Accessoride, you know, drives us crazy. Um, and oftentimes, um, people with disabilities issues are ignored because folks don't think that they can join a disability club at any time, and they can, anybody can. Um, oftentimes, people don't think about accessibility as their problem unless they are directly affected by inaccessibility. Before I became an amputee nearly six years ago, I didn't realize how inaccessible many parts of our city are to people with disabilities, even though I've had lupus since 1999. I've never lived near an accessible train station, and I've only lived in one place without steps, including my current apartment, which is a 20-step walk-up, which I have to hop up and down the steps every day, which is fun. I love it. Until I became an amputee, I could go any place I wanted to go because I could use the bus or train and or walk whenever I needed to go, even though my lupus made me a little bit slower than my peers. Now I have to go down sidewalks backwards if they're more than two inches high because it's safer for me to do that as an above and below knee amputee who uses a walker. There have been times where I had to climb down six inch sidewalks, which is extremely unsafe but I don't have a choice. A few weeks ago, after multiple 12-hour days, my body couldn't handle stepping up the sidewalks and I nearly fell over. And if the driver wasn't there to help me in the dirt and in the dark, I would have fallen over for sure. There are also a number of public spaces that aren't accessible to me for many reasons. There's a lot of walking to get to the final destination to go some places. There are a number of steps and or a ramp that is extremely steep and doesn't work for people with disabilities with a physical disability like mine. There are several locations like Bellevue, New York Presbyterian, and New York Public Library's main branch that have extremely steep ramps that are very unsafe for people with disabilities like myself to use. And I have opted out for using them because I don't want to kill myself or fly to the moon using a ramp like that. I ask that the city follow the law and ensure that people with disabilities have access to all public facilities and services. I also ask for you to include people with disabilities, various disabilities, in the discussions, and also hire them to have jobs, and not just one or two, but multiple people, because there are a number of disabilities. And I also am concerned about the, the uh, 
14th Street being shut off because there are some accessoride vehicles that aren't the big blue and white vehicles, and Sydney, Sydney's organization, the Center for the Independence of the Disabled, is on 14th Street, and I am worried that people will not be able to go to that location. Thank you so much. Thank you. Neil Weissman. Alexandra Sicca. Ellen Goldstein, Jackie Weisberg, Jonathan Hawkins, Paul Mankowitz, Nia Mocha, Diane Drozik, Matthew Shapiro, Greg Waltman, Chairman Rodriguez, uh, my name is Neil Weissman. I head up Complete George, 250 organizations, businesses, and communities calling for wider bulk bi bikeways uh, across the George Washington Bridge. I speak in support of 1557. It's forward thinking, comprehensive, and overdue, but it does not address the problem of a city with 800,000 cyclists and no recreational facilities not shared with pedestrians. If the objective is to grow mode share, know that, set that, know that nationally seven times as many bike for recreation as transportation and that hundreds of local bike shops and cycling organizations depend on having cool places to go and safe ways to get there. For city cyclists then, the GWB provides sole access to green space that the city cannot provide. And what happens to the George sets precedent for what, hap for what the MTA does with its seven bridges, which you cannot connect the five boroughs without them. The council should at minimum pass GWB resolution 0103 and have one of its 14 co-sponsors speak before the agency. Second, giving the city cyclists outsized potential to fuel upstate cycle tourism call on Albany to fund the project as an extension of the Empire State Trail. Third, because the George is a bi-state facility, enlist New Jersey. Their residents can provide a significant portion of city congestion and contribute a commensurate portion of congestion revenue. Should we lose the Hudson Rail Tunnels, New, bi new bikeways across the Bayonne and Gothels bridges will enable 45 and 60 minute commutes to Wall Street via Staten Island Ferry and widen George Washington Bridge paths would support 20,000 bike commuters per day. Thank you. I'm not really a good speaker, but this is about bikes. I came because I got hurt crossing the street and they need to be Crosswalks need to be addressed. I was told by the, the commi uh, commissioner of DOT that they don't even have inspectors inspect the crosswalks. They wait till, and I found out from maintenance, either till someone calls in the hall a citizen or if someone gets hurt. That's not protecting the disabled, right? When I said they should get a inspector in each borough periodically to look at the crosswalks and make sure they're safe before someone gets hurt, like if there's a collapse or a pothole or a plate missing. In each borough, have one person or two people driving around. You probably save injuries, tons of injuries from happening. I had two broken feet 
crossing the street and a pothole. And I'm told by the DOT, you can't expect us to fix all the potholes. There's millions of miles of road. The earth isn't even a million miles of road. I, I, I don't think. Well, the point is also the ADA law of accessibility. According to that, crosswalks are supposed to be accessible for the disabled, right? But you have a notification law from the city code that the city isn't responsible for injuries to citizens who get hurt, even killed, unless they're notified of that pothole or street deformity. How can you have one law saying you're responsible and then your code saying we're not, and yet you base going and fixing the holes, not on reviewing it yourself, by having a citizen calling up. That means you're leaving the potholes there or deformities until a citizen reports it. And that means DOT isn't doing their job of making sure that crosswalks are maintained. I think the crosswalks, the notification law, the crosswalk should be exempt from that notification. So if they do get hurt because the city didn't do what they were supposed to do, then at least they can sue. I was offered $1,000 for two broken feet and a hip. It didn't even pay for my surgery, and that's disgusting. Okay, and as I said, you need to fix what's broke. You need inspectors to inspect before. I found out the inspectors that are assigned inspect only after the area is fixed. These all things were told because I'm the biggest pain in the ass and I keep calling the commissioner. Okay, But thank someone's you, gotta do it. Thank you. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Have a good day, and thank you for listening. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Oops, sorry. Sorry. Good afternoon. I'm Alexandria Sika. I'm the executive director of the Dumbo Business Improvement District. I'm also the uh, co-chair of the Bid Associations Plaza Working Group. Um, so here to talk on behalf of uh, the collective Plaza Partners um, from the Business Improvement Districts. Uh, we love our plazas. We're glad that you all do too, uh, and we. Um, are excited to hear plans to expand the program, um, and we think it has a ton of potential to transform communities, um, a, a, a lot more communities. Um, but you know, we've been managing these plazas for 10 years and want to make sure that the program advances in a way that is smart and in a way that is sustainable. Um, so wanted to add you know, a couple of um, points the, to the discussion. Um, so in those 10 years, the city created 74 plazas citywide, um, and we have had a big learning process. There are real challenges that we encountered taking care of these spaces. Um, and each time a new plaza is proposed, a partner must be identified and must agree to take on this role. The partners we represent must weigh the benefits of the new space and the costs and responsibilities for their organizations. And right now, there are many who would not be comfortable taking on these additional spaces. Um, this partnership between nonprofit and city is key to the success of the program, uh, as the city would otherwise have to staff up significantly and handle all of this public space management themselves. We don't believe that that is a good idea either, as we know our communities very well and are uniquely and efficiently positioned to play this role. So in addition to benchmarking the total acreage of the pedestrian plazas um, as, part of this, uh, as part of this legislation, we ask that the five-year strategic plan also address the city's master agreement with the plaza partners. Um, and we've submitted a number of detailed recommendations, but it's really about um, the city taking on the liability for these spaces. This is public space. Um, we believe that the plaza partners should be treated like park conservancies uh, and would hope that the, um, the agreements between our two entities can be updated as such. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Jonathan Hawkins. Uh, I'm the manager of Streetscape and Planning for the Garment District Alliance in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, we're very excited by intro 1557 and uh, we thank the chair, Speaker Johnson, and all of the sponsoring council members uh, for proposing this legislation. Uh, being in the heart of Midtown, uh, the workers and residents and visitors in the Garment District are very familiar with just how untenable our streets have become. We have more than 1.7 million transit riders in and around our neighborhood uh, every day from subway stations, rail terminals, the bus terminal, and the path. 
And these millions of people exit this transit network onto sidewalks that are often so crowded that people are forced to walk in the street, uh, as has been discussed thoroughly today. And drivers constantly block intersections and crosswalks, and they create threatening situations uh, for pedestrians, not to mention that these conditions also contribute to the slowest bus speeds in the nation uh, and make it so that bicycling, which we think is a cheap, healthy, and environmentally friendly mode of transportation, is only for the bold and daring. Um, so we, we think this requires a wholesale reassessment and re reallocation of our roadbed, curb, and public plaza spaces. Uh, unfortunately, some solutions are already readily available, but they're just moving at too slow of a pace. We are proud to have been a part of the DOT plaza program for more than 10 years, uh, and our plazas provide some of the only areas in the garment district that are green, spacious, and inviting. Uh, but these kinds of treatments have been very slow to expand. Uh, we think the city should move aggressively toward adding more pedestrian space, including pedestrian-only streets, uh, particularly in neighborhoods like the garment district that feel dominated by cars, even though nearly everyone walks or uses transit. Critical but not mentioned in this bill uh, is the consideration for maintenance of the pedestrian and bicycle spaces. Uh, if the admirable goal of doubling the plaza acreage is to be achieved, uh, we think the city must reconsider how the plazas are maintained or better incentivize and indemnify maintenance partners. Uh, under the current arrangement, most areas of the city would be ineligible for a plaza because of a lack of potential partners. But we think this bill is a great start. Um, we are encouraged by the intent of it, and we would like to just see some language clarifying how these new pedestrian spaces would be maintained. But we're very encouraged, and um, we would, with that addition, we would be eager to support this bill. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, Chair Rodriguez, General Counsel. My name is Greg Waltman. Uh, represent clean energy company, G1 Quantum. Not so much addressing transportation, I wanted to talk a little bit about environmental, if that was okay. I'm also in favor of support of um, what my colleagues have just articulated. But uh, bringing to light, parsing through the Green New Deal scams and these value narratives that plague the media, you know, we can go back to quantum tracks, the variation of speed breaker technology I was talking about, or the solar wall application, you know, and, and maybe the solar wall application be more um, relevant for you, uh, Council Rodriguez, in, in, in a context where you can begin to understand where I'm coming from. If you put solar panels on the southern side of the border wall at 10 feet at 2,000 miles, that's 242 trillion kilowatt hours of energy that can be created. It's $291 billion at 12 cents per kilowatt hour. So whether you agree with those figures or not, if you can export energy, clean energy, to Latin America, you can reduce the ener energy costs, thus reducing the barrier to entry for Latin American citizens to participate in their economy and the global economy. And when you're able to articulate solutions like that, then you're ending and resolving chain migratory issues and then creating new revenues not only in the United States, but Latin America. And when I, when I say this, to get to this level, to get to this point, parsing through Green New Deal scams and these value narratives and Mexico tariffs, and, and it's one thing after the next. Every, every week I come here and just completely flatten the media, whether it be you know <laughs> side media or the, the New York Times. And these narratives get beaten down week after week. And, and you know, I just, I just wanted to, to say that, you know, these bids have, have been submitted to the FBO and Federal Budget Office, and now they want to play a Department of Defense issue with it, another side narrative. And these, if these solutions and these contracts can be derived out of New York, they're very lucrative for New York. I just wanted to say that because we go week after week, and I'm just, I just want to make sure that you're aware of it. Okay. I mean, we wanted to, first of all, thank everyone who came to testify around this legislation. Conversation will continue, and we want to determine to make the city the most walkable one in the whole nation. Thank you. And with that, hi, sir. Again.
I just want to let you know, I had two bro a broken arm biking once, crossing the street. Do you know, you know what I'm saying? I was hit by a car twice and another time. They definitely needed to be addressed. Well, either way. If I could wait here.